Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends. Oh, right. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse. We're an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends play d and I'm Andy, and I'm the DM for our adventures in the world of Theros. Let's go ahead and reintroduce our players right now. I'm Jimmy. I play Gron, who is arguably also hardened in the forge now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I'm Scala, resident Vorthos. I play Andromedy, a human mage. My name is Jeppy. I play Clix, the professional butt stabber. If you've been enjoying our content, <laughs> um, we have some small favor to ask of you, and that is to share that joy with the people that you are acquainted with who might also enjoy it. Hey, you know who would enjoy this podcast? Your cousin. Send it to your cousin. Let them know that you can find us just about anywhere where this type of media is disseminated on the Spotify, the Apple Podcasts, the YouTube. We really should have just recorded what you said before we started recording. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I know I'm being observed, so it's like changing. It's a it's a quantum effect, right? And lastly, we do have a Discord. Super fun. We share memes. We share gifts. We make bad jokes. Definitely worth going in there. There's a burgeoning singularity that's growing inside our Discord server. It can't hear us. Here. The, oh, I don't even want to say anything. It, I mean, you got to come pal around with it before it turns everything in the universe into spaghetti. Yeah, get right with the bot, everyone. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, while you're sharing this with your friends, buckle up because this one's kind of long, but we hope you like it a lot. So let's get back into it. You walked out of Mount Velas, you found yourselves at One Eye Pass, you camped overnight, there was all kinds of noise and other things going around, but no one really rolled high enough perception to really understand very much of the area until you got to the daytime, where you could see that there was a camp on the other side of the canyon, you got seen by a couple of cyclops, you killed one, but they were very strong, there was another one climbing up, it was going to attack you, and it got immediately destroyed by Anax hardened in the forge. His party invited you to their camp, where you talked about what you're doing and meeting with Perforos and looking for this forgotten temple to Clothis in the Ashlands, and they gave you some warnings, and they left you with a couple of potions and a hero's feast, which only lasts one day, so keep that in mind. As we now go, you're walking down this canyon-side path that descends alongside the ravine and empties out into roughly the same place where the entire gorge just stops. Just dead drop walls on all sides, and in front of you, you see a vast landscape. The Ashlands. White ash covers the entire landscape as far as the eye can see. The haze, which you can now tell is made of stagnant ash and dust, is devoid of even the slightest breeze. And the desolate air, even here, hangs heavy and still. How do you proceed? So during during Gran's time living in the wasteland, he mostly steered clear of some of the notably more dangerous parts of it, including the Ashlands. Mm -hmm. Can I do a history check on what I know about the Ashlands? Sure. That's a 10. Okay. Pretty general things. A lot of what the Spears of Annex told you kind of made sense to your recollection. On a 10, I think Gron would really only know specifically about uh, a group called the Fellhide Minotaurs. Among the various war bands that exist in the Wastes, they're more on the occultish and even demonic side. Um, they have a lot of strange rituals about eating their allies who fall in battle so that their memories may be forgotten and they would be able to erase their shame from the rest of their warband. Very crazy stuff. Those are the minotaurs that kind of wander the borders of the Ashlands. Given Minotaurs a bad name. Yeah, not good. Even compared to the Bloodhorn Minotaurs, which is one of the warbands that you're from, Felhide are very much no good. Not good news. Um, other than that, on a 10, it's hostile. Then again, to Gron, a lot of the Wastelands are hostile. How would you like to proceed? You're the native. Clicks gestures with a hand going forward. This is something quite a bit different. Than where I'm from. Not a lot of places to hide besides behind this minotaur, so you first, please. 
All right. Suppose that's how we'll do it then. Stay close. And we go in. All right. With Gron leading then, Gron, go ahead and give me a survival check as you begin to lead the party through the Ashlands. Pick a D4 on this. All right. It's a 14. Okay. Starting out, you don't really notice that your pace is slowed or you're having trouble kind of walking through the sands and ash. You do notice it's kind of hard to tell where you're going because you get a ways away from the mountains and the canyons and everything begins to very quickly look the same. Um, And on a 14, you think this is kind of borderline. You're starting to get lost. Go ahead and give me a perception check. 14. Okay. The haze gets thicker the further away from the direction you came, and you can barely see even the sun in the sky uh, as you travel. It's really just a light source above you uh, more than anything else. You know this is going to be difficult, not getting lost out here. And so, Gron or Andromedy, go ahead and give me a just a general wisdom check. Fifteen. Seven. Andromedy, maybe not used to this sort of element very much at all. However, Gron, you definitely know, you remember Perforos said this temple lied to the north. And so as long as you can maintain kind of this level of navigation, this level of perception, even devoid of very many landmarks at all, you think as long as you can keep the party moving in the same direction, you'll find where you're supposed to go. All right, northward. So that initial survival check was a success. As we move about the day here... Gron, if you're still going to lead, go ahead and make one more for me. Take a D4. What about the, uh, your moth friend? Surely it could fly up and help us get our bearings. Perhaps. Though, I do believe we were warned about some sort of flying monster out here. But uh, if you think it worth the risk, I can certainly try and get above this haze and sort of get a wider view of our surroundings. It would certainly give you an advantage on this aspect of perception and survival, but that is certainly a risk you would have to weigh. I think that's up to you, Andromedy. Mm. What do you think, Scully? Are you afraid of a big flying monster? All right. Well, let's have a look then. And the moth takes off from my shoulder and shoots up into the air and my eyes go white and I perceive through its eyes. Very cool. So do you want to take advantage through the familiar or do you want to let Gron take advantage as you assist? Um, I think I'd, I'd like to give Gron the advantage. On this. Okay. As I get above the haze, what do I kind of see in like the distance? Sure. Generally, I'll I'll give you this. Right now, your moth has to fly a ways up to get out of this haze. It's dense and vast, and Scully ascends through this blanket, and passively, that's all they can see around, save for the mountains in the distance far behind you, and some sort of formation, perhaps rocks, something, it's hard to tell, passively, to the east. Very good. All right, go ahead, Grant. Fourteen. That actually just passes the current DC for these checks. How long do you keep Scully in the air? I think it would just be like a brief going up. Okay. Getting like the lay of the land to see if there's any landmarks that are sort of visible above the haze and then coming back down. Because while I'm sharing senses, like I can't physically do anything. Right. So it would just be a brief look around, come back. They descend back to you. Gron, you can tell that the noonday sun is approaching. It's about midday, and I think all three of you can feel this exhaustion starting to creep in. The events of the past couple of days were very taxing, especially when you pushed through the mines to make it out of Mount Velas before you rested. And whether it's that or this place... You can't help but already feel pretty tired, and I'm going to need everybody to go ahead and make me a constitution saving throw. 16. 8. 18. Okay. Clicks and Andromedy, you feel fine, but Gron, after these two kind of small legs of trekking through this place, it starts every once in a while you cough under your breath, and then after a time it becomes more noticeable. 
there's an episode here and there where you can't stop coughing. And Gron, you find yourself succumbing to some sort of illness out here as you travel. You definitely feel it. You feel ill. And for the time being, you cannot take reactions. You don't sound too good. <laughs> I will, well, don't, don't, don't cough all over me. I'm fine. Keep going. Do you want to switch spots? No. So we, would it be better if we were to take a rest? Uh, what time of day is it, do you think? We can't see the sun down here. It's uh, past noon by now, I reckon. I reckon. <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I couldn't let that sit there. No, I see good. <laughs> Waiting for something to jump out, and Gron goes, What in tarnation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'll be fine. Let's keep going. Okay. Um, Go ahead and give me another survival or perception check. If you want to use Scully again, you can. It yep. would give him advantage. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can take a d4 on this as well. Guess what? Uh-oh. Bad rolls, Jimmy. With this advantage roll, that was a two and a three. Holy and, shit! And a one on the D4. Oh, okay. So that's okay. going to give so, us a total of eight. It looks like the dice want us to have a have an encounter. Yeah, that is definitely a fail. Um, we go ahead and roll. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. This is a good way to... Yeah, this is great. Good. And I'm going to be fighting without reaction. Okay. So, something, you don't know what, something rolled a nat 20 to see Scully. <laughs> Whatever rolled probably knows Scully's social security number at this point, <laughs> honestly. Okay, Gron is doing a well enough job to stay on course, leading in the same direction. And out of the corner of your eye, Andromedy through Scully, you see thick clouds of ash billowing up nearby your party. On the ground, Gron, you can't really see anything because it's just all this haze. But in the brief moment that you are using your familiar, Andromeda, you can see that something is quickly approaching your party. You have a moment, whatever it is, Andromeda, you come out of your familiar senses. You know there is a billowing cloud heading towards your party. What do the three of you do? Uh, get behind Gron. Let's go ahead and have everybody roll initiative. Uh, okay. Nope. Nine. Seven. Nineteen. Uh, Andromeda, you are up first. You don't know what is out there, but it is heading towards your party. What do you do? I'm just going to ready an action to cast a spell if there's a target I can see. Okay. Uh, up next, I'm making these attack rolls with disadvantage. From beyond your line of sight, you see three spears. These are with disadvantage. Highest being a 12 plus 5. That's going to hit Gron. You see a spear flung out of the haze beyond your line of sight. You take 7 piercing damage. <clears throat> as from beyond this haze, you hear voices shouting out, Looks like we've got guests wandered far into the wastes. Do not spare them. Maybe they have something of value. These whispered voices muffled through the haze. That is Gron, you're up next. What direction are these things coming from? Give me a perception check. 21. Great. On a 21, I'll actually say, so there's a point where you can see clearly. It's about 30 feet out, you can see perfectly. Then another 30 feet where it's much harder to see. And then the 60 feet beyond. It is nearly impossible. On a 21, you can see a group of four humanoid figures roughly 60 feet away and approaching. Do I see horns? On a 21, gleaning in the hint of daylight that peers through this haze and mist. You don't see horns, but you see the reflection of brilliant metal on their returned masks. Does Gron know what returned are? Probably. I, I think anybody who lives in this world knows what they are. You would all be able to quickly know that the returned are those who find a sort of precarious escape from the underworld by taking the path of Phoenix. 
Generally, it's thought that returned re-enter the world sort of blank in this undead pseudo-state, no longer possessing the ability to really remember who they once were or form long-term memories. They generally can't really live full lives after bargaining to escape the underworld the way that they have. And so most experience fleeting emotions and follow hollow routines kind of at the edges of the world as a whole. Looks like returned. I can't reach them with my movement on my turn, so I think I'm just going to stand my ground. I can give Clix the help action if he would like to hide behind me on his next turn. <laughs> you can definitely do that. Right. I like that. <laughs> so Gron gives Clix the help action, and that is Clix. Clix hides behind Gron. Go for it. Go ahead and give me that with advantage. Gron, what is your what is your help action look like? Oh, uh, I take my huge, surprisingly gentle minotaur hand and just kind of guide clicks to behind my massive form. Nice. I'm forming this wall of beef. 23. Okay, awesome. You think you are very well hidden as Kron completely blocks the line of sight. What else do you do? Stay hidden. <laughs> Okay. We ready my weapons, uh, but that's about that's literally it. Cool. That is back to Andromedy. Uh, first, go ahead and give me a perception check. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a twenty-one. Okay. Yeah. After Gron kind of points out what's coming towards you, you as well start to see the glint, the reflected light in the gold returned masks. Go ahead and give me either an insight or history check yourself. Sure. Um. It's going to be a 21 history. Okay, awesome. You would know maybe a handful of tales about Returned. Not about specific people, but you know about the few sort of necropolises that exist in the world, as well as that some Returned simply seek places where they'll be left in peace, and others kind of tend to be much more aggressive or even go so far as to interrupt caravans or trade routes and steal or murder uh, whoever they find kind of drifting aimlessly along these open roads. I'm going to move into range. Um, Does an 18 hit? Yep. They're going to take 10 points of lightning damage. Uh, Great. As a witch bolt uh, sort of forms a lash around them. Uh, between me and them and shocks them. Nice. You hear one of them cry out in pain as they take this lightning damage. The others kind of move around them and continue approaching. So the one who who is under this witch bolt is kind of standing in place. He goes to draw a short sword. The other three continue charging forward. So the one that you attacked kind of walks forward towards you, closing the distance, and attacks with their sword. Rolling a nat one, just slashes towards you, and the aftershock from the witch bolt is kind of steering their sword off course. The other three, one of them says, Don't let that one get away! As they point towards Gron, not seeing clicks behind them, and those two are headed towards Gron. The fourth one is going to also attack Andromedy. This is with pack tactics. So these are these short swords that appear to have some sort of poison coating on them. That is an 18 on the dice. Yep, that'll hit. And this is with a short sword also. Slashing into you for four slashing damage and an additional four poison damage. Hero's Feast says you are immune to poison. Does that mean poison damage? Oh. I think that's... Oh, oh, wait. Or just oh. being poisoned. Poison oh, fuck. I should have... Probably both. <sighs> Sorry, there's a there's a lot going on here, and I just am forgetting so much. Um, no, it's all good. There's a lot going on just in the Heroes Feast. Yeah, Heroes Feast is a is a thing. As their poison blades strike into you, you are able to resist that aspect thanks to the benefits of the Heroes Feast. Okay, cool. I maintain concentration on the Witch Bolt. Great. That is Gron. All right. Um, how far away are they now? They use their entire action to dash, so they're they're pretty much melee range with you at this point. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to enter my rage. Cool. 
kicking up the sand around me, feeling the heat coming off my body. The dust starts to swirl around me. And there's a lot of it. There is a lot of it, yes. And I'm going to take my maul and just smack the closest one. Go for it. When he goes into rage, do I take two damage yeah, and you come do. out of hiding? Sorry. Yeah, you do take three points of damage. Um, Glitz, just go ahead and re-roll the stealth check for me. You still get advantage. Fourteen. Okay. So they all take some damage. Um, Gron. All right, Gron's in a blind rage. He doesn't apologize to Clicks because he didn't even notice that he hurt him. And he's going to attack the nearest returned with his new maul. Nice. Come hide behind me. It's very warm. <laughs> doesn't hurt that much. That's a 23 to hit. That absolutely hits. And that's 15 bludgeoning damage. Great. Gron, as you kick up the dust and ash that heats up around you, it forms kind of this small cloud because the ash is so thick that in the immediate space around you, you can barely see anything now. That's Gron's turn. That is Clix. Clix is going to come out and attack the same person. Okay. So Gron, um, at the end of your turn, I need you to make a constitution saving throw for me. That's a 20 plus 7. Awesome. That's <laughs> wild. Um, you kind of cough a little bit after after taking your swing and kicking up all this ash and dust. <coughs> if not for you being incredibly beefy, you know that perhaps the more ash that you trudge through and the more ash that you disturb in this wasteland, the more you might be apt to succumbing to whatever this sickness is. But you save, and sorry, that was clicks. Okay. Attacking the returned. Uh, the one that Gron just hit is extremely hurt. Okay, um, gonna go ahead and guess that a twenty-two is gonna do it. Yep. Uh, Seventeen damage. Awesome. Clicks. Go ahead and paint a picture. All right. So clicks. Uh, it turns around. <laughs> And then runs up Gron's backside and leaps off of Gron and just impales through the top of the skull this returned with his short sword. I love it. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. They fall to the ground. Uh, this sort of ichor, not quite blood, but not quite ooze, pours mm. from their skull. Is there another one in melee range? Yes, there is. Okay, let's go ahead and do our uh, offhand. That person's not formally engaged with Gron yet, though, right? So I don't get advantage? It just needs to be within five feet of an ally. I think we clarified this last time you would. I would. Okay, cool. He doesn't matter. That's a nat 20. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Five total damage on the offhand. Even with the crit? Yeah. Two and a three. Cool. This one's looking a bit hurt. <sighs> I like your bracelet. It looks valuable. As he looks at your phoenix armlet, that is back to the top, that's Andromedy. You can kind of see behind you that these other ones have engaged with Gron and Clicks while you battle the one in front of you. Uh, they're going to take another four damage, uh, lightning. Okay. They kind of writhe in pain from this. They're already starting to look hurt as well. That is their turn. The two on you, Andromedy, are going to both attack... <laughs> That's a 17 plus 4 from the first, yep. and another 17 plus 4 on the second. Dang, all right. A, a, a 15 and a 17, and a 1 and a 17 on those. Yep. So that was 11 from the first, and only yep. 5 from the second. Okay. Back to Gron. All right. I'm going to hit the one that's closest to me. Go for it. That's an 11 to hit. That will miss. Wow, it's possible. You swing down, and the cloud of ash around you, obscuring your vision, it glances off their side. All right, I'm really angry now, and I'm going to do something that I forgot to do last round, which is take a second attack. <laughs> oh, man, Jimmy. <laughs> That's a nat one. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. Not rolling above ten this game. Oh, my gosh. Clicks, give me a dexterity saving throw, please. Oh, shit. 15. Okay. Yeah, you see this maul come swinging down, and you are able to dodge out of the way. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is great. Only on an at one, folks. Uh, that is Gron's turn. We go to clicks. Okay. Attacking once again. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and guess a 19 will hit. Yep. Sick. Uh, 16 damage. Clicks, go ahead and paint another picture. Nice! nice. 
All right. Uh, so as Gron, you know, wings it and biffs it with the maul, and it kind of comes at me, clicks quickly, reacts, and jumps on top of the maul to get like a dashing jump and lunges into the other one's neck with his short sword and just takes him out. Very cool. Straight out of an ARPG. I love it. Uh, they fall to the ground, and you are left with the two that are fighting Andromedy. Anything else from Clix? Yeah, Clix is feeling real froggy about all that. He's feeling pretty cool, pretty good. He's going to start running to the aid of Andromedy. Uh, I don't know if I make it there. You can, and you can split up your turn in such that you can still use your offhand, even though you moved and then put to do it. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to do, yeah. Nat twenty again. Oh my god! Oh man! It's always got to come on the on the dagger attacks, doesn't yeah, it? This Clicks. garbage little old guy. Uh, five. Grunge is gonna go lay down for a little while. You know, it's about hey, time. Grunge hey, uh, hey, like. clicks. So these guys, these guys have twenty two health. Yeah. They previously had seventeen damage. Let's do a little math here. 17 plus 5. <laughs> I think oh, I only did 14 to them, because I rolled a 10 and a 4 on the D12s. Oh, they wouldn't have taken the 3 from the rage. From Gron, That's no. Right. Okay. So sorry. Uh, clicks, they uh, are on Death's Door. Uh, You're not gonna bad. kill Steel from me! As they're kind of writhing in this odd witch bolt electric energy. That is back to Andromedy. Okay, I, I may now regret doing this. Is this a possibility I could roll less than a three on the D12? Hey, man. But, you know, uh, I, I try to remain neutral in my rules litigation. And these are the wages of my sins. I roll the two on the D12. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, just, it just kind of falls to both knees, still, still alive, still clinging to this half-life that they have, just looks up at you and says, mm. Are you sure this is our fate? And they are going to attack you. That's a 15 plus four. Yep. And this is a straight roll. This is a... Because the, the one on the ground is staying on the ground, but slashes out at you. And that's a 12 plus 4. That will miss. Awesome. Uh, just missing. Uh, the guy, This guy just kneeling on the ground slash, swings out at you, coughs up a little of this blood as he does and misses. So the one hit is another 4 slashing damage. <laughs> Okay, I maintain concentration. And that is again Grom. All right. Grom's going to amble his way over to where the action's happening now and uh, position himself so he's flanking with uh, the others. Mm -hmm. And But clear enough, far away enough that I'm going to reactivate my storm aura and anyone within 10 feet of me is going to take three points of fire. I damage. see. So you're kind of doing that as you're approaching, so only the, the returned would actually take it there. Right. Cool. Yeah, so one is as close to death's door as you can be, and the other one is not too hurt yet. I'm going to hit the hurt one. Go for it. I'm going to try anyway. Ron's having a bad day. That's going to be a 13 to hit. That will miss. <sighs> so I heave my maul at this one and miss it completely, and it lands in the dust and kicks up more dust. And yeah, he, he kind of just leans to one side. What's wrong? Finish your friend's job. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Gron sounds so pathetic. It's not Gron's day. Gron's having a bad day. I heave my maul once more. Going for this one again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the same roll. Oh my god. But Gron's just trying. That's clicks. I'm going to uh, use my main hand attack on the one that's less weakened. Okay. That is a 23. Yep. Okay. 17 damage. We need to get you a, another handful of D6s, buddy. <laughs> Clicks, three for three. Go ahead and paint us another little vignette. All right. So the, the one the one returned is kind of in front of me, you know, on their knees, swinging desperately to try and hit somebody. I quickly turn around and just no frills, traditional throat slash the other one with the short sword. And then I turn back around and we're going to try and do some work with the... Uh, no traditional. Wait, help me understand. 
Did the one with no throat just say that as the little dying, or the other one who's about to die? The other one who's about to die said it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and try to snuff that one out too. Okay. This is the third nat (laughs) twenty. Hey man, you're just wasting them now. All right, so it doesn't matter what I roll, but just for the sake of it, uh, four and two, six damage. Obliterated. As the one says, how traditional, right in the middle of the word traditional, I just dagger right into the mouth, right in the open mouth, and end it. I guess you are going to kill steal me. Yep. Drawing your bloodied blade, they collapse to the ground, and we exit initiative. Well, I feel pretty good about that. Yes, you uh, you fought well. Gran just keeps walking without a word. Uh, anything on the bodies? Uh, go ahead and give me an investigation check. Sure. I only got a nine. Uh, Seventeen. Okay. Um, their weapons look pretty simple, and other than their kind of dark robes and and clothes, the only real thing they look to have a value on them are the masks themselves, which I think in Dramedy, in hindsight, you would know taking returned masks can be a pretty precarious notion. Um, unless I unless I see Clex going to, like, lift them. Clex is going to try and take the mask. I will put a hand on Clex. Clex, you think they're these valuable golden death masks? Why not take a couple? Absolutely. I would not take those cursed things. They cannot be bought, and they mark people who would defy their fates, so they are doubly cursed. Well, I defied their fates. I killed all their owners. Can't these be smitten down into gold? Shit, smelted. Smelted. <laughs> smitten. I like the clicks that say Can, Let me take that line again, please. No, just leave it. <laughs> okay, fine. <That's> funny. <laughs> no gold escapes Erebos' realm without some, some foul curse upon it. You're going to have to elaborate, or else I'm taking these with me. The gold has left the world of the living, passed into the underworld, and its jealous master has laid a curse upon it. I don't know what else to say. Can they be smitten down into gold? Smelted! What? Smelted. The word you're looking for is smelted. Okay, but the gold. The gold remains cursed, no matter what metallurgic process you put it through. Clix tosses the return mask into the ashen earth. And, you know, mumbles under his breath, stupid riddles, this preacher is insufferable. So, Clix, you actually go to take one off, and you can see that the face beneath is grotesque. In all of its features are kind of sunken into the face, and it, it almost looks as if any any form of individuality, any form of identity has been stripped away from this person, and they are left lacking any characteristic at all in this sort of alien, unnatural, undead way. Go ahead and roll a d6 for me. What kind of omen does a five get me? Andromeda, you, you hear them kind of scoff at you, except by the time they are finished mouthing the words, they have gone mute. Um, Clix, did you say something? Clix turns back and just gives a shake of the head no to deny. Because, you know, Clix doesn't want Andromeda to know that he just made fun of them. Because Clix is a bastard and just tries to do <laughs> bastard things all the time. Um, Andromeda, go ahead and give me an insight check. Sure. 22. A foul omen has just taken place in this scene. <laughs> Andromedy does, like, <laughs> cup their, their face in their hands. Andromedy's so over this. Andromedy full double palm faces. <laughs> Andromedy's wondering Clicks. why the fuck they chose to bring clicks along. Because I don't make any of my own goddamn choices. Clicks, I don't know how many times I have to express this to you, but I'm not trying to deprive you of some valuables. I'm trying to warn you about a curse. You, you understand that, right? Clix just rolls his eyes. <laughs> Keeps walking. I'm sure there will be objects of value in the temple for you to uh, take. Then let's get to the temple. Andromeda, you only hear the temple. Yes, the temple. You see him mouth a complete sentence, but the only... It, it's like the voice returns by the end of the sentence. I see. The momentary muteness only lasting about a minute. Mm, okay. Meanwhile, Gran is trudged off, away from this scene, a little while beforehand. And so, as Andromedy and Clix catch up, Gran, go ahead and give me another survival check. Uh, you can take a d4 on this. 22. Okay, hey, there we go. At least I'm good at something. Gran, 
the sun is beginning to kind of fade into an afternoon sky, and you come across a small ruined building. Maybe it was at one time uh, a watchtower or an outpost of some kind out here in the wastes. But it is on your chosen path. What do you do as you approach? Looks like shelter up ahead. Let's check it out. Be careful. Um, all right. Okay, I'm going to approach it. Cool. Go ahead and give me a perception check. 13. So you see ancient and worn down stone. It's as if this building, this ruined tower, may have been here long before any of the other buildings that you've ever seen, say in Akros or anywhere else. You can just tell that there is the wear of ages of time on this structure and you look about you see a kind of entryway an archway perhaps it had a door at one time but the door has been destroyed over time and just glancing through on that perception roll you can see it would make serviceable shelter if you wanted to use it for a rest or there might even be something inside you can't really see into it and the whole thing is maybe about 30 feet around as we approach, are there any markings on the structure? Any carvings? Anything like that? Give me investigation. That's only a six. On a six, you don't see anything discernible on the outside. Again, the walls appear to be heavily weather-worn out here in the ash. Mm. Would I, like, history know anything about, like, people or things that might have lived here? Just kind of generically, not really, but go ahead and give me a history roll. Sure. That's uh, only a 15. On a 15, the best you can assume is that this might be some sort of ancient outpost between whatever civilization once lay nearest here and perhaps the temple. Mm, okay. Can I take a look around for any like loose stones to try and pull or markings on the wall? On the outside or are you going in? Going to go in. Okay. Clix enters. Go ahead and give me first perception as you enter the space. One. Is it even a building? You enter and... It's a room! Clicks, I'm going to need you to make a dexterity saving throw. Oh no, Perfect. it's trapped! Yep. Uh, Bubba, 17. Okay. Clicks, you walk in and immediately your eyes are drawn to the walls. You know, maybe there's boxes or barrels or cabinets or something you can rifle through. And you fail to notice that the ground beneath your feet is quicksand. Or in this case, quick ash as it begins to kind of swallow you up rather rapidly. However, you save, and so you are able to very quickly shuffle your way out of this pit. Is the whole interior quick ash? No. So it's okay. it's just about a 10-foot space around the door on the kind of the inside of the entryway. Okay. Does it look like there's a safe way to get in, or is... It, like, anyone who steps over this will have to make a save. Uh, go ahead and give me investigation. Sure. And clicks, you can do that, too, because you're now on the inside. Uh, that's a 17 investigation. You think, I mean, clicks made it across, so at least you know the whole thing isn't covered in quicksand, but even on a 17, you don't really see a way to go around it. All right, I'll go ahead and do an investigation on the interior. Go for it. Uh, 19. Okay. You see that there may have been a second floor at some point, and the majority of it has collapsed down. So you actually look up and see a bit of open sky and rubble down one wall. You see a handful of crates in various states of of ruin, and you see above, kind of on the one small section of a second floor that is still intact. Mind you, there's no roof, so it's just a second floor and then open sky, um, that there appears to be some sort of surveying or looking glass device, partially intact. I want to go take a look-see at it. Okay, so you make your way up. Go ahead and give me an acrobatics check as you try and climb up the rubble. 16. Okay. You are easily able to climb your way up with the help of second story work. It's very easy to see. You make no problem of it whatsoever. Gron and Andromedy from outside the entryway, you see clicks begin to scurry up some rubble. 
and clicks, you approach this odd sort of ancient device. It's it's basically a telescope, but kind of built into this structure and still largely intact. It's pretty much the only thing in this tower that isn't completely destroyed. It's pointing out into open space. And can I see the actual temple from here using that? You want to use it? Go ahead and give me a perception check with advantage. Uh, 15. Peering out, you see haze in all directions, but indeed directly north, or at least directly in the direction that Gron has been taking you all, you see a distant outcropping. There are kind of ruined pillars that are leading towards this landform of some kind. It's kind of a small, craggy hill that rises out of the ash. You see something out there. Okay. I'm just going to shout down and do north not much longer from here, and then start making my way down to them. It's getting dark. What do you mean, not much longer? Hey, DM, what did I mean by not much longer? (laughs) (laughs) Um... Well, without really knowing the exact mechanical properties of how this ancient telescope works, you can assume it's within a couple miles. I'm going to assume it's a couple miles. Mm. At least uh, another hour's travel, and then we don't know what else might be out there. I think this is a good enough spot to make camp, yes? I agree. We won't be able to see anything once night falls. All right. Um, I'm going to... there's still this, like, this like sort of pit in front of the door, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. If you can get up the wall, maybe you think you can go down through the collapsed floor above. I mean, I was going to cast Levitate on myself. Okay. Just yeah, to that, hover that over, the, uh, over the pit there. Sure. Uh, but I guess I can go up to the second floor and see if there's anything I can see up there. Yeah. Um, so you've got Levitate up. I suppose that means you can just Levitate up the rubble as well. Yeah, I can sort of push myself along the side of the wall. Great. And you see this kind of ancient telescope-like device. Go ahead and give me perception with advantage. Sure. Uh, 16. Similar results as clicks. You see this kind of feature out in the distance peering up from the flat ash wasteland all around. And as well, you see maybe slightly slightly more clear than clicks. Every once in a while, there's like a ruined column or toppled pillar. It's kind of pathway through the wasteland leading towards it. Mm. Yes, uh, the path is that way. Uh, there should be some markers, more ruins as we come closer. Gron, how are you going to get inside? I'm going to take a few steps back and then run and long jump over it. Awesome. E- easy enough. Just go ahead and give me an athletics check. 18. Yeah. With ease, you clear the pit there, and the three of you are within this ruined watchtower. Is it getting dark yet? Not really, but Gron, you kind of get the sense that it's like, it's going to be dark soon, soon enough. This was probably a, a safe bet. You certainly don't want to be out here while it's dark, so, you know, it's it's probably, like, mid to late afternoon, and so you could basically take a long rest and, and get up early and, and, and make the rest of the trek. It's been a long day. I think we should rest and approach tomorrow fresh. Well, I'm wide awake. I'll take first watch. Be my guest. Um, I will watch whenever you need me, uh, but I think Andromedy will sort of settle down and start reading one of the books they took from Mount Velas. Great. Before Gron goes to sleep, he's just sitting there, kind of introspectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry about what happened today. I know that you rely on me in combat, and my role is a protector, and I faltered today, and I promise you it will never happen again. Gron, what are you talking about? You almost single-handedly uh, brought down a, a Cyclops. But the returned... Something about this place just shakes me. I can't explain it. Also, nice job, Clicks. Hey, thanks. Turning to Andromedy, which book would you like to start with? Uh, The the Tome of Understanding. Mm Mm-hmm, I thought as much. You open this rather heavy, hand-bound tome. Most of the literature in in Theros is, is scrolls, whether they're kind of the classical 
vertically opening or kind of larger sideways and 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 various things like that but th- this is actually fully a tome kind of bound together and its pages almost look like themselves coming from different ages as you flip through well go ahead and give me a arcana check for me uh could i use guidance to help myself with this sure 22 awesome how long do you spend reading this book it's still pretty early afternoon, so like you can probably take a good like four or five hours before you actually go to have to go to bed. Okay, um, in that case, I'll probably spend two hours uh, reading this book. Okay, and a great roll. You begin reading, and at first, this book is just kind of rambling on about various philosophies of the gods and their nature, and it really doesn't make any sense. It's like sometimes you read a sentence or a paragraph and you're like this makes sense i i understand this whoever penned this is talking about the nature of the gods and then you read a different sentence or even the same ones that you've just read and understood and suddenly it doesn't make sense this happens for about a half an hour until finally you get to the point where you find a very distinct clarity and a voice in your mind one you definitely don't recognize, but seems well enough, seems to emanate out of this book, and reaching out to you, it says, Hear these words, and know thine wisdom. Countless tales and tapestries tell the history, deeds, and nature of the gods. Sometimes these play out among the constellations. Some are chanted in the hymns, inscribed in the temple walls, told around campfires and hearths, and collected in scrolls. Some are simply fables meant to illustrate a single facet of God's character or moral behavior. Others are communal, monumental epics. The people of this world do not bark at contradictory myths. Consider these words. Is Caridus, God of Thunder, the literal child of Thassa and Perforos? Did he spring forth from Thassa's heart when her rage grew too great for her to control? Or did he come into being when Perforos tried to steal back his secrets from Crufix? To the people of Theros, it doesn't matter whether these tales describe literal facts, for each of them are true in their own way. Voice fades. So we are going to call that one successful understanding of this tome. Nice. And it takes one, two, three for you to fully gain its benefits. All right. Awesome. So what would you like to do next? Uh, I think the other like thing I'd like to do a bit of reading of tonight is the construction of constructs. Cool. You pick up this book. It talks about basically the difference between entities that are naturally born of Nyx, such as the various nymphs and dryads that exist in the world, and the creatures that are formed from the will of the gods, such as the anvil rots of Perforos, which you have dealt with quite a few of now, as well as some of the sort of odd in-between forms, including the dragons that you fought, which were maybe once born of the natural world as being just simply dragons, and then transformed by the will of a god into a semi-Nyx, a semi-Nyxian creature. Mm, okay. And it goes on talking about how these sort of powers can be transcended into humans, into humanoids, into mortals. And as you read it, you kind of begin to understand the wonder that is how Perforos can restore the life of someone like Anax as kind of the ultimate nature of one god made manifest and given form. Go ahead and give me a another Arcana check. Uh, oh, dang. Uh, 18 plus 7, 25. Awesome. Best you can surmise, you, you glean two things. One is that the legendary relics that the world knows, that the world knows of being attached to certain, oops, to certain gods like Thassus Bident and Erebos's whip and Perforos's hammer are just as much living constructs as any of the Nyxborn creatures that they create. That their properties are so powerful that they themselves are practically avatars of those gods, transformed into these wondrous 
relic items. And you glean that perhaps the creation's eye is another example of such a relic. If it is, then whose is it? Because Clothis has a spear, and Perforos has a hammer. So there's something odd there. Either maybe it once was Clothis's or something. So you, you gain that. As well, you gain the Artificer Infusion Humunculus Servant. What? Or at least the, the understanding of how to make one. Okay. It would be, it would be essentially a, a Nyxborn. Dang, that is really cool. Yeah. So you spend your evening reading from these various tomes and books. Gron, after apologizing, <laughs> goes to bed clicks, restless, takes first watch. Go ahead and give me a perception check. As a four, a little too, a little too high on the combat that just happened to be paying any good attention. <laughs> you're, you're distracted. You're still thinking about those return masks. <laughs> Did you see me jump off that uh, mall there? That was pretty cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> I guess he's talking to Andromedy. <laughs> no, he's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. <laughs> Andromedy sort of looks up from their book, shakes their head. Clix is literally talking to himself about how badass today was. Yeah, and, and just like staring out the entryway while he's just talking to himself. Um, <laughs> Clix, you see absolutely nothing. And um, on a four, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing... You're just too distracted by how badass you were today. Pretty cool. Which sounded more like Gron than Clix. Maybe Clix is pretending Gron gave him credit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so sad. Clix, I'm going to need you to roll a d8 for me. Cool. Very cool. Seven. That is pretty cool. I say, hey, seven's a great roll. Clix, you're paying zero attention to the world outside of this tower. Or the world inside of this tower, for that matter. When suddenly you hear a wind that sounds like a literal hurricane on top of you as a massive ash storm sweeps up in the vicinity of your makeshift camp. Now, luckily, you all have taken cover underneath this ruined tower. And so this sweeps up. Gron, you are stirred from your sleep as you hear the whipping of ash and sand against this stone tower. Clicks. I need you to make a constitution saving throw. And then because the rest of you have cover, I need both of you to make a con save with advantage. 21. Uh, 15 over here. 17. Cool. So this had a higher DC, but you all still rolled above a 15, so fuck me, I guess. Damn right. As you are able to cover yourselves from trying to consume too much of this ash, that you don't succumb to any more of this kind of odd illness that exists in this space. Clicks. After a brief period, about 10 minutes, the storm lessens and your watch ends. Click surmises that Gron needs a relatively uninterrupted night's sleep, so does not stick him with the second shift, and instead wakes up Andromedy. Sounds good. You're up. Anything Anything out there? No. All right, then. Okay, Andromedy, go ahead and give me perception. Uh, 14. Okay. Perfectly still land around you, the darkness of night without any clear visibility of Nyx above. After a time, you see in the distance, far enough away that you can't really make out any detail, but close enough that you can tell there's someone out there who... something that is much bigger than a humanoid or a group of humanoids. Does it appear, like, approaching? Give me a perception check. And... Do you have any light on right now? Yeah, I usually use Scully for these watches, and she has dark vision. Uh, yes, this is flat roll. Uh, so that's a 12 perception. Okay. You don't think so, because it's kind of moving very slowly, but but moving at a, a decent enough pace, kind of across your line of sight in the distance. It doesn't look like it's approaching, but it doesn't look like it's getting farther away either on that roll. Okay. Whatever it is, it is big, 
And amidst the haze in the darkness of night, it weirdly enough comes across as darker than the ambient night around it. Mm. Almost this kind of black against the dark, hazy backdrop. Um, and I suppose, like, which cardinal direction is it in relative to us? So relative to you, it's moving, like, kind of parallel to your current path. I suppose I'll keep an eye on it in case it does come closer to us, but I won't take any action. Then go ahead and give me one more perception check. Only an eight. Okay. After a time, you do lose sight of it, and then maybe 20 minutes or half an hour later, you can tell it's time for the last watch. All right. I wait for Gron. I will say, uh, I saw a shadow moving to the north, large, but its form was indistinguishable amid the haze. I'll keep an eye on it. Thanks. Thank you. And I go to bed. All right, Gron. Six. Cool. Gron, I need you to go ahead and roll a D8 for me. Three. Yep. Gron, you hear this sort of wailing, not too far off. It's kind of moaning wail. Where? Where am I? What happened? The temple. Get to the temple. I can't see anything. These voices in the shadows, in the dark of night, haze. No hope. No hope remains. Flee. We must flee. These various voices, they're getting louder. Can I go up to the telescope thing and see if I can find them? Sure. Just go ahead and give me a quick athletics or acrobatics check to try and scale up the rubble. Ten. Are you being stealthy while you're trying to do this? I wouldn't, no. Okay, yeah, because a ten is not great. I'm going to roll perception for them. It's a nat one. So this is going to be a flat perception, the advantage from the telescope being canceled out by the lack of dark vision. That's a 12. On a 12, you see this group of people pretty close by, within 100, 200 feet, and you can't really make out too much about them other than, while they have this sort of dead, ashen skin, they have no masks. This is something different. You don't know what this is. How far away are they? It's pretty hard to tell in the darkness, in the haze, but you can see them even on that kind of middling roll, so probably like somewhere between 100 and 150 feet. Okay. Just kind of ambling around, shouting to themselves, but generally headed in your direction. The screams and wailing getting louder. Unless you're going to wake them, I'll say Andromeda and Clicks can give me a perception with disadvantage in their sleep. Mm, got a nine. First was an 18, second was a four. Oof. Yeah, you're still sleeping. All right. I'm going to post up up here and just keep an eye on them. Okay. About a minute goes by and they're still wandering around nearby, but not towards you. Another, Another couple of minutes go by. You get the sense that these people, whoever they are, whatever they are, they look lost. They're just kind of wandering around yelling and generally kind of in in some weird frenzied kind of panicked state. They don't approach your camp, but for the majority of your of your watch, they're still nearby. Why? Why have they forsaken us? Ruin! Ruin! Mm. Seems like they're having kind of a hard time out there. Uh-oh. Gron's first instinct would be to kind of draw them closer so that he could possibly offer them shelter, but he's really not going to necessarily jump to do that. Mm. He wants to, though. Mm. Does it look like they were like really in dire straits, or are they just kind of yelling like that? Give me another perception check. That's a 13. Okay. I mean, they, they look pretty panicked. They also look pretty worse for wear, like pretty injured. Even in the darkness, you can kind of see like almost like faintly like glowing burn marks or something. Like some of their clothes are kind of have some like lit ash as if they were recently on fire. I feel like if I was in their situation, I would want someone to reach out and help me. And I also am no stranger to helping people survive in the wasteland. And so I'm going to try to get their attention. All right. How do you do that? Well, I'm standing up on this structure, so I'm going to start by waving my arms before I make any kind of noise. Okay. Just be as conspicuous as possible. 
Don't sure. Do it. They're, they're Dark Souls 3 protagonists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead and, uh, go ahead and roll, roll a persuasion check. <laughs> All right. 12. Cool. Sure. You kind of flail about on the top of this ruined tower, and after a time, a couple of them see you, and they shout out quite loudly. So, Clix and Andromeda, go ahead and give me another perception check with disadvantage. While they scream out, Save us! Help us! We're dying! Help us! Save us! And they begin to, to amble towards you. You can tell they're not, they're not really in a big hurry for all of these people who seem to be, you know, pretty poor off. They're kind of shambling. 19 perception. Okay. Andromeda, you awake to this commotion. Two. Clicks does not. As they approach, can I tell how many there are? There appears to be a group of maybe about somewhere between six and eight. You can't really tell. Okay. Sounds like someone's in trouble. Can I nudge Clix away? Sure. Boy, wake up. Someone's in danger. Clix uh, springs awake. The two of you see Gron uh, at the top of the kind of ruined pile uh, up by the telescope, and you hear these various shouted phrases getting closer in the distance. Yeah, all right. I'm going to head towards the commotion. So how do you get out of the, the tower? How high up am I? You're like a whole story up. I'm going to jump down. Okay. Gron jumps down. Just go ahead and give me a quick acrobatics or athletics check. 11. Okay. Uh, you jump down. It's not very pretty. And amidst the darkness, you take one bludgeoning damage. Oh. <laughs> uh, clicks, you see Gron jump off of the, uh, the top of this tower. I'm going to make my way towards Gron. Uh, and... Okay, so you're going to go up and jump off. Go ahead and give me an acrobatics check. How do we do on a 15? Uh, on a 15, you jump a full story and land pretty gracefully. Uh, almost cat-like. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, you see this this group of people ambling towards you, shouting all of these various words of ruin and chaos. Andromeda, what do you do? I look sort of out the door. Uh, I don't want to, like, leap over the pit, but can I, like, sort of make anything out about these people? So the door is facing south, and they're kind of coming from the north, where the the same side as the, the telescope was on. Is there, like, another way out of the ruin that we're in to the north, or do you have to go up and over? Just other than jumping off the, the second story, that seems to be it. My acrobatics and athletics are both kind of sad, so if that's where the thing is, I'm going to levitate up and over. Okay. Just go ahead and give me a perception check andromedy. Oh, wow. Even with this advantage, that's a 19. Yeah, you can see this kind of crowd of people. Again, they're they're like, you know, it looks like some of them aren't really walking very well, and, and they're just kind of shambling while they're shouting as if they're in great panic or terror uh, towards your party. They don't look like returned, but they don't look like they're alive either. They look like they've been gravely injured. Parts of them are burned. Some of them are almost still on fire, this kind of faint glowing to their clothes and skin and some of them have horrible burn marks and wounds. As they all kind of approach Gron and Clix, you see them now close. They're they're within 20 or 30 feet of you out in this darkness and this in this waste, and you now they're just shouting out to you as they get closer and closer and Help us! Save us! Ruin! We have all been led to our doom! Just shouting all of these things. What do you what do you all do? Who are you? What do you need from us? Gods, spare us! Spare us! Give me a insight check. Five. You think they need help? I work for the gods. What do you need? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> they have sent a messenger of death. We will be ruined. This will be our end. All of you hear all of this as Gron tries to plead to them and, and offer help. Andromeda, you're watching this scene unfold in the dead of night, and your best guess, like, to the extent of your knowledge and your best wisdom, you think these are victims of Vesios. These half-dead people who, as it was said, as you were warned, wander this wasted ashland in ruin and peril, as if they are endlessly and Oilessly reliving their events. There is nothing we can do for them, Ron. Well, there has to be something. Look at them. Gods, save us! Spare us this ruin! Perhaps, but is, it is beyond our power to do. 
I think I've seen all I need to see here. I'm going back to bed. Click starts to walk away. So what, we just leave them here? I mean, they're probably doing this every night. (laughs) (laughs) They are neither living nor dead. They wander this place, their souls too anguished to pass over the great river. That's exactly how we're going to be tomorrow if we're not rested enough. Do you think it would help them? Could I maybe help them be more dead? (laughs) Andromeda legitimately shrugs at this. Um, perhaps. Or perhaps it would simply add trauma to their pain. Andromeda, go ahead and give me a religion check. Sure. Uh, 19. Okay. You have a feeling that this sort of otherworldly state that you find this group of people in, their shouts for salvation may as well be a cry for help and may as well be a cry for someone to end their suffering. You know, ignore what I just said. Perhaps if you uh, meet them with sufficient violence, they will find that forceful push they need to get to the underworld finally. Is that too much of a 180? Did I do Did I do too it's much? It's fine. Like, no, like, again, I, I, I didn't know what to do there, so I'm glad you gave me a roll. You know, hurting people is one of the only things I'm good at, but I really like to help people. For all intents and purposes, they are out here by themselves. And this may very well be, like all of the other signs and omens of the gods, a mercy for these people. But even on a 19, it's hard to know if that's the reality or not. It may be we could help them on their way to the underworld. I've helped many on their way to the underworld. I think we could help them out. I'm gonna attack one. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Save us! Ruin! We are ruined! Go ahead and make an attack roll. Okay. I really tentatively hold my maul up over my head with both (laughs) hands and look this look this person in the eye. This is this is probably an experience Gron has never felt before. You look into their eyes and you see frantic panic, but you know, no ability to express it. They they have a look of terror, but their bodies cannot show it. They can only cry out in their woe. I give one more glance to Andromedy and one to Clix and then bring down them all. Okay. And at this point, Clix has stopped walking back to go to bed. He's a little curious about this whole <laughs> tableau that's going on in front of him. That's a 15 to hit. That hits. Roll damage. Yeah. Their AC is probably one. <laughs> that's 12 bludgeoning damage. Gron, you swing down at this figure and... They slump into a pile, and there's almost this salvation expelled as you see the sort of clinging of whatever soul remained in this vessel leave it, as well as a cloud of black ash. I need you to make a con save. 24. Okay. You pass. You only take half. Uh, You take four necrotic damage. And you could tell that, whoa, these guys may not be violent, but this is foul. And your hit points could have been reduced by their maximum value, but you did save against it. Yeah. All right. Gron and anyone else, I'm actually am going to need initiative here because they can't attack, but they can grapple. 20. 18. Uh, nine. Okay. So, uh, Gron, that was one swing. What do you do next? Hmm. There are seven left, and they are all near you. I'm going to activate my rage. Okay. Uh-oh. So, they all take three points of fire damage. They are all injured and wailing out this fire. As, as you, as you, you know, invoke your rage, it almost is like a spark that ignites fire that was already there. You see them alight in this kind of gray, ashen flame, obscured and kind of mired in their form. You can now see them a lot clearer as uh, there's now a pretty good source of light as, as many of them erupt flames. Cool. I'm going to attack another one. Go for it. That's a 23 to hit. Gron is back. Absolutely absolutely hit. (laughs) 14 points of bludgeoning damage. You drop a second one. I need you to make another con save. That one's going to fail, probably. Nine. 
That is a fail. Two fucking ones. I rolled two goddamn ones. You take two necrotic damage and your hit points are reduced by two. Gron, that's your turn. It's now Clix's turn. You can see Gron is becoming enveloped in this swarm of ash zombies. She's going to go attack one of the ash zombies that is close to Gron and get advantage on it. Go for it. You leap forth into battle. 21 to hit. That hits. 15. You clicks deftly cut another one down. I need clicks and Gron to make a con save. 20 plus 7. 17. Okay. Uh, Again, that's only a 2 and a 3, so you both take 2 necrotic damage. No hit point reduction. I'm both saving. It is now the swarm's turn. I need Gron to make an opposed athletics check. 23. (laughs) You clicks, you see there's five or six of them left at this point, and you see they begin piling and clawing up at Gron, shouting out in their woe and misery, and Gron is having none of this. He is in no way grappled. He is in no way restrained. His massive form kind of flinging them off of him. (laughs) Clicks, however, you also need to make an opposed athletics check as they begin to envelop you as well. 16 on the dice, 18 total. You as well. Maybe not as large uh, a presence knocking them off, but you're able to dodge and avoid being grabbed by this swarm. I'm going to use my reaction to attack one of the ones that tried to grapple clicks. Go for it. That's a 19 to hit. Yep. And that's 16 bludgeoning damage. Drop another one. Offhand. Uh, Does a 16 hit? Yes. They have incredibly low AC. Okay, and uh, four damage to one of them. Okay, that doesn't drop one, but it's on death's door. Um, And now I need both of you to make another con save because you dropped another one. Fifteen. Nineteen. Good rolls today. You both pass, um, and you both take five more necrotic damage. That is Andromeda's turn. You're up on the top of this tower, and you see this fray taking place. I'm going to cast Magic Missile at third level, and I will target one at each, and I suppose I'll roll these two first at just one of them, and then the other three will take one projectile. Okay. Uh, So the first one takes eight points of force damage. Okay. That's another one at Death's Door, unless you wanted to drop the one that Clicks had already bloodied. Uh, no, that's going to take one. Okay. The next one takes two points of force damage. Okay. Another one takes... Five points of force damage. Okay. And I guess the one that Clicks hit will take uh, five points of force damage. Down. Gron and Clicks go ahead and make another con save. <laughs> 14. 22. Jesus. 14 just passes. Oof. And so that's another two necrotic damage. And we're back to Gron. There are three left. Sorry, Clicks. I reactivate my storm aura, and they all take three more points of fire damage. You drop two of them at once. I guess I am also taking the three points of damage. Yes. Yep, and I need two more con saves from both of you. 22 and 11. 26 and 18. Okay, so that's five for the one that you both passed, and then four clicks, that's the fail, so your health is reduced by four, and Gron, you take two from that. And there is one standing. Gron, you still have two swings. I'm gonna smash it. Go for it. 25 to hit. Absolutely hits. 14 bludgeoning damage. Absolutely destroyed. Make one more con save for me as you swing down. Ooh, 14. 21. Okay. Okay. And that's another four for both of you. And Gron, paint a picture as you disperse this swarm into the afterlife. All right. So after setting a bunch of them on fire and smashing through a bunch... Just a miserable scene. Yeah. (laughs) This very last one, I assume still moaning and wailing, I raise my maul up above my head just like I did the first one and look directly into its eyes as if to say, Are you sure this is really what you wanted? Forsaken! Yeah, I thought so. And I bring down my maul and just flatten it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Now, interesting quality, you've dealt fire damage on both of the turns that we've been in initiative. And so from the heaping ashen pile of bodies, you see an unnatural twitching, as if some of them were to rise in this odd, sort of disgusting state of undeath. But as they are lit in a flame, after a moment, that passes, and they lay still, having passed on into the underworld at last. We did a nice thing tonight. Yeah, I feel good about what happened here. We're good people. Yeah. It sounds like you're talking like me now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're good people. <laughs> Holy shit. Ah, oh, yes. We are good people. <laughs> oh, my God. We're the nice guys. Oh, my God. Got that God. right. Um, Grand, go ahead and roll a d6 for me. Three. The sort of viscous, unnatural blood that has spilled and pooled in this pile of bodies. At a passing glance, it looks as if it is boiling. Death and slaughter follows you even now. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing as it fades from your mind. You gain two pie with Mogus. No, 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 no. You're wrong. This was a good thing I did. I was being good. Are you alright, Grom? Uh, I'll be fine. Bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Clicks ambles back into the ruined tower and promptly goes back to sleep. After the remainder of the watch, you see nothing else errant in the distance, and a few passing hours later, you do eventually see the light of day break through the haze. And a long rest is achieved. That almost seemed like a weird dream. Anyway. Anyway, let's, yeah. Let's, uh, let's get going. We're almost there. All right. Uh, is Gron leading the way again? Sure. Go ahead and give me a survival check. Uh, take a d4. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Seven. Gron, you know, you couldn't have gotten the group that lost already, but the ash is much deeper in this space than it was before, or at least than you remember it being, and soon enough... The party finds themselves almost ankle deep or deeper, this thick, gray ash. And unless you slow your pace, which will require at least one additional travel check, then you may risk the notion of this ash sickness that has been kind of following you around. All right, let's take a minute here, figure out our bearings. We're still heading north, so let's try this again. As you say, perhaps there's a better way of moving north. Grom, I've been meaning to ask you, how was it that you came to learn the language of humans? My dearest friend, Califex, taught it to me. He was a human. He is a human. You see. We traveled together for many years, and he taught me his language, and I taught him mine. I'm sorry you were separated. I hope fate sees fit to bring you back together. I think it will. I think that's what this whole thing is all about. For me, anyway. I just wish I knew he was safe. So you are going to slow your travel to avoid kicking up any of this heavy ash? Yeah, definitely. Go ahead and give me another survival check. Take a d4. Okay, here we go. Gron, doing what Gron does. Yes, it is. And that's a 20 plus a 2 plus a 4. That's 26 total. Hell yeah. Gron, your pace might be slowed, but you make up for it in trajectory. You find, after a time, a few of these errant, ruined pillars out here in the waste and the ash. And you remember the array that you saw with the telescope. On that roll, you set forth with your party, and you begin to see it in the distance, through the thick haze, this small, rocky hill itself, just as gray as the rest of the landscape around, but there is where you will find this temple. Up ahead. Let's go. You cast off the doubt that you had as a protector, and you are able to push forward and the party eventually arrives, and you look upon a half-buried pile of sun-bleached, ash-covered ruins. Shattered columns mark what 
what could have been a grand entrance in its time. Half crumbled and ruined walls mark a rough outline of a perimeter that is set into this rocky hillside. And you see many of the secondary stories to this structure have either collapsed or completely eroded away over time. Everybody go ahead and give me a perception check to approach. 13. It's only a 12 for me. Four. So, looking about as you approach, you see that there's this sort of central entryway marked by these columns. Some of them ruined, others still barely standing, holding up the partial ceiling that still remains. They're like a central, like, altar, or... It looks like there's something within this main entryway. It is cast in shadows and haze, but it does look like there's something inside. All right, I'm going to go in and take a closer look at it. I suppose I will make a perception check as I enter, just to see if there's anything, like, lurking. Yeah. That's a nat 20. Hey, there we go. Happens to everyone. Eventually. (laughs) So you approach, and there's these wide and long stairs that slowly slope up into this entrance. And you don't see anything lurking in the shadows of the mist in this chamber, you see a ruined statue. In its time, this must have been enormous. What ceiling still remains is some 60 feet high, and you see rock limbs and what may have once been a a dress of some kind, and beautiful carvings, and in front there is a, a, a bust without a head, and all of these different parts of this massive statue. Now, you're not 20. Head or not, you can identify this as Clovis. Then I would approach the statue. As you approach, in addition, on the nat 20, while you see no immediate threats in this area, you cross the threshold and you immediately sense a strong magical presence that permeates this area. This sort of shimmering and shining in the corners in the mist and haze of the space and in the shadows. Almost like when you look up at Nyx, but it is instead all around you within this haze. Very cool. Give me an arcana check. Fifteen. It seems quite unbelievable, but also slightly unsettling to your body. There's something unraveling, unsettling about this magical field. And you know on a 15 that at the very least you should be cautious about. I will say to the others, the consecration of this temple still remains. Be careful inside and show respect. I look at Clex. Why are you looking at me? I'll just give this to you as well because you rolled so high. The only other detail of note is that behind the shattered altar where the statue once stood, there's indeed a passageway. As well, to the right of the altar, there is a... Maybe it was another hallway, but it's partially collapsed in and you can't really see past it. I'm going to sit in front of this altar, and I'd like to use my Oracle's Piety just to do an augury on, like, which path should we take. Okay. I'll go to the pathway behind the rubble, because that's probably the the less obvious path. I'll ask, weal or woe, should we seek your crown down that pathway? And I'm going to be here for ten minutes if you guys want to poke around some. Is there anything that Gron and Clix do while Andromedy is casting this spell? I think I know what Clix is going to do. I took what Andromedy said very seriously, so I'm going to kind of follow Clix around <laughs> to keep an eye out. Cool. Clix, what are you doing? Clix is actually not immediately going to try and steal anything. Put that out since I know that's exactly what you were getting at. What I want to do is just take a peek inside that passage and get a sense of how long it is and... If there's, you know... So that would be investigation. Yeah, 24. Feeling good about that. That's still a great roll. And so you kind of look up and down and try and peer through and see if you can see anything on the other side or how long this hallway is. And these stairs that lead down, they only seem partially collapsed to you on a 24. And beyond, it looks like there's something of a overgrown with plants or something, but they're all petrified and buried in ash and it might have been a library or a arboreum or something or maybe both but mm. that's what you can see beyond in that passageway let's see what the preacher comes up with before we go down this one you spend 
your ritual casting a spell, and you get this feeling of errant, knotted threads. Something perhaps valuable or informative to your quest, but also not without its danger. I'm going to say both. I will relay that information to the group. There's something we can use down there, but it will be a treacherous pack. I'm rested. Let's go. Anything valuable in this debris? In the debris itself? No. It's rocks and collapsed wall and ceiling. How long do we think it would take to excavate that tunnel? Not terribly long, but you don't know how much of a scene it would cause as far as noise or anything else. Hey, before you start whacking that mall all over the place for this debris, I think we should go check out the other passage. All right. Okay. So proceeding down the open hallway, the corridor is about 20 feet of sheer stone walls and mostly intact ceiling. Occasionally you can see haze and natural light seeping in above. Go ahead and give me perception, anyone. 17. 18. 30, 20. Okay. All three, actually, you come to the end of this hallway and you can see a large, dark room in front of you. But the first thing you see is there's some sort of wire or thread at the entryway into this room that Andromedy immediately sees and notices, and very quickly after, the other two notice as well. A large chamber with massive piles of what look like tangled thread that lay about the space in tatters. And then in the center, you can see what may have been some kind of large mechanism. It's like a large thread weaver. A loom, perhaps? A loom, yeah. The kind that you see... Shut up. What was that movie where they try to bend bullets? Wanted. Yeah, with Angelina Jolie, right? Like, yeah, Morgan Freeman was the, the loom. Yeah, loom. it's it's exactly like that, but it's in ruins. Is Morgan Freeman in this room? No. <laughs> Morgan Freeman's presence in a room generally affects my RP, so I just wanted to... So that's what you see so far, as well as this kind of thread or wire in front of you. If it's dark in here, I can cast light. Okay. So I snap my fingers. This red flame appears on my fingertip. I touch it to my book, and the book will radiate light around it. Very cool. How do you proceed? Andromedy would notice what appears to be a trap, and probably notice the others notice as well, and say, we ought to step carefully over that. Uh, Gron steps carefully. Cool. Gron, you're going first? Sure. Go ahead and give me a acrobatics check. Acrobatics. Not a very high DC, but... Not a very high roll. Uh, that's a 12. That'll still pass. All right. You step carefully across, and you are now within the chamber. Easy enough. Hey, do you want guidance on this? What does guidance do? And yes. You can add a D4. Yeah, please, because that was a pretty ass roll overall. Perfect. Okay. 14. Easy pass. I will also give myself some guidance, and... 16. Easy pass as well. The three of you manage to step across the threshold of this room without activating whatever trap was set. Now inside the room, you still see this pile of ancient machinery, as well as the threads that lay about. The room itself is not very large. It's maybe 40 by 40. So once you're inside, you can now see that on the left and right walls, there are two more passageways. The one going left is collapsed, and the one going right is open. I wonder if there's anything here worth looking at. This would be investigation now that you're inside, if you want to look closer at anything. 18. Okay. Clicks, you begin investigating. You kind of look into some of these broken parts, and you see a really shiny object. It almost looks like a dagger to you. This very fine stiletto-like dagger that has an opening where a cross guard would be. It almost looks like a giant needle. It looks very fine, and it's maybe about an arm's reach inside of this device. If it looks like a giant needle, how big is the thread? It's curious. Some of the thread looks like ordinary thread, but others are indeed much larger. The whole room is gray. You assume most of it's still buried in ash, so you can't really tell what color any of these threads originally may have been, but... On the ends where they were severed or cut or destroyed, on the bits of mechanism, they almost have a faint 
dull red glow to them. And on that roll, you can tell that it's not coming from the light source themselves, just faintly glowing. And as well, it seems like more and more near this large needle is glowing stronger. That's interesting. I'm going to grab the needle. All right, you stick your hand into the ruined mechanism. Go ahead and give me a sleight of hand roll. Twelve. You pull this dagger out, and the lights begin to glow brighter and brighter. All three of you begin to see, as Clix pulls this dagger out, these small orbs of light rise out of this machinery and move and dance about around Clix. I'm going to start putting the dagger back. I want to see if the orbs start to go back to where they were. They do not. Great. Might as well keep holding it, then. Would I be able to identify what sort of magic is at work here? Go ahead and be Arcana or Nature. Okay. 17 Arcana. Okay. You think that these are, at the very least, some sort of small fae or Nyxborn creatures that have made their home here. And you can't tell if they're part of these threads in this facility, but Clix appears to have stirred them. Realizing this, I will say in Sylvan, Hello. I am Andromedy. I come here as the voice of Clothus. If you are guardians of this temple, then we are here as friends. We seek relics or objects of power that may be used in the execution of Clothus's will and the fulfillment of destiny. Go ahead and give me a persuasion check. Sure. 19. Okay, nice. At 19, you look at these, and they begin dancing about... They move away from clicks and towards you. They're floating in the air, maybe about ten feet up. And you hear whispers in Sylvan. Clothis holds no power here. She left this place long ago. Tread light this forsaken. Forsaken. Forgotten. Forgotten. Abandoned. Abandoned. Temple. 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 You are forsaken no more, spirits. Clothis has returned from her eternal watch to mend the damage to destiny. Going with that same persuasion role. Rested long we have. Unable. Unable. Uneasy. Uneasy. In our slumber we have been. Dread with caution. With caution. Past the puzzled chamber. The vault beyond. Beyond. A malevolent force within. With caution. Dread. Caution. And they vanish. Clicked while putting the needle slash dagger into his robe. What'd they say? They said they have rested here long, uneasy, that some dangerous force has taken residence within the vault, beyond a puzzle chamber. But they're okay if I take this, right? They did not seem to oppose it. So, Clicks, you have now a magic dagger of some sort. It would require a short rest to know what it does. Otherwise, identify or or detect magic would suffice. Okay. But you can definitely tell it is magical. Cool. Let us continue exploring for the time being. All right, let's go. So the right passageway is open? Yes. Gron will lead. Cool. Gron going first. Go ahead and give me a perception check. 21. Very cool. In this hallway, which is a bit longer than the previous, you can see sections of the walls and the ceiling that are collapsed. Bits are exposed to the elements, a bit of dim daylight peering through in various places, and you come to a point where this winding passageway opens into a small room. You can see large circular pools many of them with collapsed debris filling parts of them. But one, the farthest away pool from this entrance, 30 or 40 feet away, still looks to have water or something in it. And is this something that Andromedy might know about or could roll to know about? Go ahead and give me another Arcana or Religion check this time. Sure. Dirty 20 on Religion. Awesome. So the three of you are still in this hallway, kind of peering in this next room. And Andromedy, on a dirty 20, you know exactly what these are. What's that? These were scrying pools. When this temple once operated, the sages of destiny would come here to see the future that Clothus had planned. Can they help us see the future? I guess I will approach the scrying pool that still has water in it. 
you step into this chamber. The room itself, not perfectly square or rectangular. It's odd. The space has five walls instead of four. And on three of them, you see partially ruined murals. Go ahead and give me investigation or religion again. Uh, that's only going to be a nine religion. Okay. The only details you can still make out are one that they all share, and that is on the center of them, the details of this mural kind of fading at the edges. You see a deific face, perhaps Clothis's, but it's as if the artist who made this put three faces next to each other, overlapping more like in a way that an eye is shared by each of the three faces. So you have one in the center, and the center one shares its two eyes with the face on either side. Right. Okay. I take note of that, and I continue to go towards the scrying pool to see if I can get it to function. Great. You approach, and let's start with investigation, please. Uh, Only a 12. Okay. The liquid in this pool is pristine, clear water. This pool and its contents are completely preserved. Also moving about this room, you notice in one corner the floor momentarily moves. It moves and shifts as you approach and then is still. All right. This corner, being one of the far corners, is now about 15 or 20 feet away from you. I step back a little bit in surprise and curiosity. Something the matter? I think I saw something move over there. Under the floor, perhaps? Gron, I'll go investigate. Go ahead. That's a nat one. I don't see anything. (laughs) It's on top of him. (laughs) How close do you get to the corner of this room, Gron? As close as it takes. Great. You approach, and you just see partially ruined stone and rock. However... Just a bunch of rocks. uh, Gron... (laughs) This fucking ooze just crit on you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. Bring it on, ooze. Out of nothing, this gray mass envelops one of your feet. You take four points of bludgeoning damage and 11 points of acid damage as this gray ooze envelops your leg. Uh, uh. Let's everybody go ahead and roll some initiative. (laughs) Fourteen. Five. Six. With a minus two to dex, this ooze goes first. (laughs) (laughs) So it's going to go, and then the three of you can go in any order. So it's going to make another attack on Gron. That is a 16 plus three that'll hit again. That's only one bludgeoning damage this time, but an additional seven acid damage. And what type of armor? Gron's not wearing any armor, is he? Gron doesn't wear anything but pants. Gron's all beef. That is the end of its turn. I'm going to shake my leg violently, trying to shake this thing off, and I can't, and I'm getting so angry, and I enter my rage. There it is. (laughs) Cool. And it's going to take three points of fire damage. You invoke your rage, and normally the sorts of monsters you envelop in your fiery aura seem to really get hurt from the fire. This, whatever this is, seems to be resilient to it. Getting damaged, but not as much as you would expect. Ugh. All right. I'm going to attack it recklessly, just trying to get this thing off me. 22 to hit. More than twice over hits. (laughs) And that is... 16 bludgeoning damage. Very cool. You seem able to break your leg free of it. You swing into it, and it tries to envelop your maul, but the magic of your maul, your gift from Petros, is completely resistant to its corrosive effects. I'm going to attack it again. It's a 19 to hit. Again, easily hits. 12 bludgeoning damage. You smack down again onto this gray ooze, and... A bit of it slumps off, uh, bloodied. So that was Gron. The two of you see him smacking at the floor in the corner of this room. There's something over here. Something oozy, gooey. Click says to Andromedy, do something about this. Okay, I am going to... Cast a spell. 
cast a spell. Yes, I'm going to cast a spell. I'm going to cast a shocking grass. That's no fun. You're no fun. All right. And I'm going to have Scully deliver it. Sorry, I'm trying to conserve resources. No, that's fair. Absolutely fair. I mean, it's an ooze. You don't cast wish. Wish. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever's good. I don't know. Scully just crit? Scully just crit! I don't have enough D8s out! You love to see it. Scully is secretly the most powerful one of us. 19 lightning damage. Alright. Scully gets to paint a picture! <laughs> okay, so I conjure this crackling red energy in my hand. I form it into this little ball. Scully flies off of my shoulder, picks it up between her legs, gently goes, and it just drops it on the floor. And this crackling red energy shoots through this ooze, causing it to convulse wildly before it falls inert. It does. It falls inert, and the combat is quickly ended. The gray ooze that was lurking in the corner of this room now vanquished. Ew. Is there anything left? It looks like ordinary stone now. Go ahead and give me investigation. Eight. Yeah, it just looks like it turned into these flat, broken rocks. It's just a bunch of rocks. What about the bunch of water that's over there? Yes. I'm going to go back to the scrying pool and see if I can turn it on. Cool, cool, cool. Andromedy, go ahead and give me an arcana check. I'm going to use some guidance on myself before I do this. This seems like it might be important. Ooh, 26. Hell yeah. You peer into this pool and... You can tell, using this pool, you can cast Scry. Okay. That roll is so high, I can just tell you, this pool has like one use left before it is tapped. I see. Okay. So, not only can you Scry with this, but this basically acts as a giant crystal ball, which means you can detect thoughts when you scry with it, you can cast suggestion when you scry with it, or you can cast true sight when you scry with it. I turn to the group. There is a small bit of power remaining in this pool. Who or whatever I wish to see with it, I will do so unerringly. I will be able to perhaps read their thoughts or send them a message or see all that is around them as it truly is. I have no idea how I should use this power. What do you all think? Uh... Can you see what that uh, cloth, cloth, whatever, that, that god of yours is thinking right now? Cloth is far too powerful to be affected by such mortal magics. I suspect the same is true of the other gods. Not very powerful water, is it? <laughs> Andromedy shakes their head. Just... So do I. <laughs> I am I am shaking my head. <laughs> oh, sorry. I could look at anyone in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's trash. That's Dasani stuff, not Evian. We need better. <laughs> well, I can think of someone who I'd like to see right now, but I can't imagine how that would help us on our quest. Your friend, Caliphas. That's right. There's someone I'd want to see too. Who? My father. Lyukar. Lyukar. You saw him in your vision before. And you saw Califax, was it? Yeah. And we can only see one of them? Only one. You're the one doing the scrying. Who do you want to see? I believe our path may take us to both of these people. Fair. Do you know where your father is likely to be? What he is likely to be doing? I can't imagine he's left Akros at this point. It's probably still there. If not, not too far. Hold up in his private estate, safe from all the harm that everyone else is enduring. Then it would seem we have the least information about Califax. Very well. All right. Stop being so nice, Gron. Let's find his friend. Come, peer into the pool with me. I do. I will look into the pool. I will cast scrying. I will say, show me Califax. Big money, big money. If you have anything that he once owned, or any sort of material link to him. Uh, that will help me see more clearly. If you have no material link, if you can describe them to me as best you can, that will help me focus the spell's magic. Alright. Califex is 
a little guy. He's skinny, you know, and he's got skinny arms and skinny legs. He's uh, not very beefy. He's got long hair. He's got a pointy chin and, you know, square jaw, and a nose that goes straight up and down, like doesn't poke out at all. As Gron describes Califax one detail at a time, Click starts to change form and disguise self, slowly assembling the correct components of what makes Califax look like Califax over time. Cool. Yeah. Right now he's probably wearing a crow in clothing. Dumb sandals. I look down at my dumb sandals. <laughs> a little bit of armor, red toga. Very cool. Yeah, that actually, you kind of look like him. That's pretty good. Clicks disguise himself to the best of his ability, given the description. Clicks, go ahead and give me a performance check with advantage. 18. Okay, so that will definitely help the scrying. So Andromedy, go ahead and roll Arcana, and given all of the effort and your previous Arcana roll, I am also going to give you advantage for this. I'm also going to give myself a little bit of guidance on this, because of course, while I only need an 8, who knows what could happen. Exactly. Uh-oh. It's a good thing I gave myself guidance. Oh, man. Because the 2d20 were a 6 and a 7. Oh, God. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> On the 7 plus 2 is 9, plus 7 is 16, which meets the Man, DC. Man, which beats the 15 DC. All right, I'm going to go ahead and make my roll. It's making this at a minus 10. That's a 3 on the dice. Andromeda, you peer into the scrying pool, and in an instant, your vision is pulled into the pool and suddenly across a vast desert wasteland. You are rushing through clouds and down towards Akros, but not within it. Your vision arrives in the middle of the desert where you see Califex. Pretty closely to as described, he is in a crow and hoplite gear, and he appears to be crouching behind a large rock formation. Next to him, on either side, are two more crow and hoplites. You can't make out too many details about them. Occasionally, he peers up and over the rock face, looking in a direction, as if looking for something. That's what you see so far. Go ahead and give me a perception check. Only an 11. So you see all of those things, and when he peers back down, you get a very good look at his face, and he looks kind of worried or anxious, or maybe a little scared, but you can't really tell which one. You see a hand get placed on his shoulder, and a voice, it's not his, but a nearby voice, say, Steady boy, we'll be all right. He responds, I've never seen so many of them. They just keep coming. How will Acro stand? Is he going to be okay? Is he safe? It is unclear, but if he is engaged in the defense of Akros, his safety is not guaranteed. I could suggest another course of action. What could you do to help? You traversed the wasteland together for time, yes? Yeah. So he would be capable of making his way north on his own, safely? No. It's too treacherous. Either one of us would have died, if not for the other. Andromedy, as he says that in your ear, you can see he peers up again over this rock formation. Go ahead and give me another perception check. Again an 11. You see he looks up again. You can't make any of the details, but you get a sense that he's not too close to Akros. But he's somewhere in the wastes already. You can see shadows of figures moving in the distance, as if maybe he's scouting other warbands, which is the best that you can guess. A different voice you hear also say, It's no matter now. They've already breached the gate. What hope do we have for the Colophon of the Citadel? You hear Califex respond, But we must have hope. Erois will stand, I know it. You see Califex look up past your point of view, for a moment almost as if Staring directly at you, his vision continues up into the sky. You hear him say, oh, Wherever you are, I just hope you're safe. Who is he talking to? Other hoplites, it sounded like. No, the last part. I look away from the pool, directly at Grom. One would think you, no? I will find him. We'll be together soon. If there was something you would have me tell your companion, what would it be? Stay safe, brother. Help is on the way. 
I, I cast suggestion. I say, Kron wishes you to know. Stay safe, brother. Help is on the way. I suggest you do not give up hope. Very suddenly, Calfex reacts to that. He doesn't move around noticeably. He gets very still, and you can see his eyes darting back and forth. He looks up out into the sky. I knew it. I knew it all along. And slowly, your scrying spell fades. Immediately, the water in this pool begins to muddy and darken, and the walls collapse around it, leaving it in a semi-ruined state, the same as the rest. Thank you. You do not need to thank me. I am merely helping fate along its course. Clix turns back into his normal form. Thank you. Andromedy, I need you to roll a d100. Okay. 27 on the percentile dice. Oh my god. Uh Uh-oh. This wasn't a trap, but you did use a magic item. And so, I need the three of you to roll off against each other to see who gets targeted by this. It's gonna be me. It's gonna be me. It's gonna be me. Alright, I got a 10. 17. A nat 1. Cool. A couple of seconds pass after the pool is reduced to rubble, and you can see the errant Nixian haze that has permeated this entire temple flare up around the pool. Clicks, I need you to make a wisdom saving throw for me. Are you kidding me, it's wisdom. I mean, okay. Four. Clicks, you are suddenly polymorphed into a cat. That's not even a polymorph. An actual cat. Okay. Do my robes and personal effects shrink to size, or are those just on a pile? For flavor, we can say that they have miniaturized. I love it. (laughs) It's like a little cat costume from Petco or some shit. Huh. Can you, uh, do anything about that? (laughs) Great reaction to... Like, can you imagine if one of us literally right now in this call turned into a cat? Bamps into a cat. And and someone's like, hey, can you do anything about that? No shock, no awe. <laughs> Just, is that something you can fix? No, you want to address that problem? Yeah. <laughs> After the past few days, Gron can't be surprised anymore. <laughs> can I do anything about that? You know Clix has been polymorphed. You could dispel it if you had the means. Otherwise, you'd have to wait out the duration. I... Assume I don't know the duration off the top of my head. Go ahead and roll Arcana. Sure. Uh, 24. About an hour. (laughs) I pet the cat. Yeah, seems like the right thing to do. Clicks just starts whale meowing, you know, like when cats just meow because they've had it. There's a small circle of missing food in their bowl and they they think they're literally about to starve to death. It's that flavor of meowing that occurs. Astonishing. He's actually cute for a change. (laughs) The meowing gets a little louder. And decidedly more angry. (laughs) Can you understand what we're saying? The meowing gets louder still, (laughs) and even more angry. The the effect of the spell should wear off in an hour. When Andromedy says it's going to last an hour, clicks immediately, scurries up Gron's back, and perches on his shoulder. Well, I suppose this should give us some time to excavate the blocked-off doors, if we want to return to the central chamber, until this temporary curse has been lifted. And then we can proceed in our exploration. All right, let's go. And so, with Clix now a house cat on Gron's shoulder, you return to the previous chamber. How do you proceed? Gron starts to stretch his arms, one arm over the other, and gets to work excavating, moving these rocks. Nice. Go ahead and give me an athletics check. <laughs> That's a 23. Easily. Gron, you begin lifting these heavy rocks and... They're not that heavy. <laughs> these heavy boulders and pieces of wall and ceiling out of the way of this path. It takes you maybe 15 or 20 minutes to clear the whole thing. What do I see? You see another winding hallway beyond. It seems like most of the roof of this one kind of collapsed, and you're left with now a rough trek through this hallway, but you've cleared away most of the rubble that is actually blocking your path. I don't know why, but for some reason I feel comfortable in winding passages. Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. Yeah, you do. (laughs) Well, it'll probably be looking at whatever position of the sun I can possibly discern. It'll probably be a 
a while longer before Clix is back to normal. I'm just going to read my book on dragons. So you're not going to go forward, you're going to wait it out? Yeah, I think so. Okay. We can count this as a short rest. Damn it. And so, (laughs) Clix... What? I was going to say, while polymorphed, attunes to his magic dagger. Okay, that was my (laughs) question. That was my question. Can cats understand (laughs) daggers? (laughs) You... As a cat, have this this magic item. This is what's called a Fate Weaver's Needle. It is a plus one dagger, a magic weapon, with an expanded crit range of 19 to 20. And so, as a cat, you understand this. I don't know if you want to react as a cat or not. Click starts purring. And this is a very tiny little needle now, so... Playing, yeah, playing with, like, this little tiny dagger. That's amazing. So, Andromeda's going to read On Dragons and Other Natural Creations. Mm -hmm. Cool. You begin reading through it. Sections of it are in Celestial, which I think you can also read. Yes, you can, as an oracle. And other sections of it are in Sylvan. It appears to be a compilation, and parts of it read as a follow-up to the title The Origin of Monsters, which, go ahead and give me a history roll for. 18 History. You would recognize that title. It's a anthology about the birth of dragons, basilisks, manticores, and other beasts that were born from the natural world itself on Theros, rather than being created by gods. And the book goes on to include a couple of stories, one about Thraxes, which you already know very well, the ancient red dragon that was granted a place of honor at the peak of Mount Velus by Perforos. You read about a dragon named Mithria, also called the Azure Flame. The section about this dragon says that it was thought to come from the result of Keranos interceding in a feud between two dragons, which had ravaged entire coastal cities in their wake. He punished the two by fusing them together and casting the resulting creation into the sea. It also talks about the dragon Time Drinker, whose true name has been lost over the ages, that was said to have a separate feud against Nylea. It talks about various wars between men and giants, which were also thought to be natural creations of the magic of the world rather than Nyx, and encounters with various nymphs. And it goes on listing the various varieties, the LC, the Dryads, the Naiads, the Oriads, which you have encountered a couple of, and the Lampads. After reading this information, mechanically, from now on, you have advantage on wisdom and intelligence checks when referring to dragons, giants, and nymphs, as well as a scroll of dragon's breath. Ooh. So that's what Andromeda does during their short rest. Gron, what do you do other than lift heavy things up and put them down again? Let me see one of those books. Certainly. What would you like to read about? Would you like to hear some stories of dragons? That's what I'm reading right now, but I have... I just finished this tale about constructs, relics, and their properties, and the creations of Perforos. Uh, or, 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 or this one. Uh, this, this tome is about the rise of Melitus and the defeat of the Archons, or uh, this, this one's a bit more esoteric. Uh, what are you interested in? Uh, give me the dragon book. Sure, sure, come sit with me. This story I'm reading right now is about Mithria, who was once two dragons, but was fused by Keranos as punishment for menacing his disciples. Gran opens the book and looks intently at the page for a while without turning the page at all. Right, it's in the celestial tongue of the gods. You might not be able to understand it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Do you, uh, have one in, uh, Minotaur or Common? Ah, yes. This history of civilization is in the Common Tongue. Gran opens the scroll and just looks at it for a while and then says, What's this word? Imperious? Uh, It sort of means overbearing, tyrannical. Hmm. Okay. And this one? Is Gran literally just pointing to each word? Yeah, pretty much. So, as... 
Andromedy tries to teach Gron a little bit about these tomes that they have collected. Your short rest comes to an end, and just as suddenly as it had occurred, the polymorph on clicks ends. Mid biscuit. Oh, glad that's over with. Let's go. All right, let's go. You proceed down this passageway, and at the end, you arrive at another large chamber, the ceiling of which is largely intact. It's pretty dark in here, but oddly, the floor is dimly glowing, as you can see the outline of 15 large tiles, kind of arranged three across and five down, that cover the entire floor of this room. At the end of this space, you can see a gargantuan set of horns carved out of the stone that spiral down and form an archway above a large stone door. Gran just starts walking directly into this room. Gran, you approach, and all three of you hear a voice within this space. Through chaos and impulse, seek thy path toward untold destiny. Gran, you step forward and give me a perception check. 16. There are a bunch of symbols on each of these tiles. The one directly in front of you appears to be a large star of some kind. Do you proceed? I glance back at Andromedy. Should I keep going? What do you feel like doing? I proceed. Cool. So, you step on the tile, and this eight-pointed star glows faintly blue and green. Go ahead and roll a d6 for me. Five. Gron, you see for a moment two ethereal arms, extra arms, sprout from your body, and... Clicks and Andromeda, you see Gron step on this tile, you see the faint glowing symbol, and then Gron blinks out of existence momentarily and arrives back at the beginning of the space next to the two of you. Mm. The arm's gone? The arms are gone. Andromeda or Clicks, if you would like to give me investigation. That's a nat one for Andromeda. 15. Clicks, you look at this, and each of these large tiles, you get a look down the room without stepping on any of them. Each has a different symbol. And the first one, the one that Gron stepped on, was indeed an eight-pointed star. The two on either side of it is the symbol of a large bull's head and the symbol of a large urn with water pouring out of it. Those are the three that you see immediately in front of you. This one has you on it. I think you should step on this one. Okay. I go and stand on the bull one. Very cool. The three of you see the symbol on this tile begin faintly glowing red and black. Gron, go ahead and roll another d6. Four. Gron, you hear a tremendous bestial roar erupt in the distance. It quickly fades, and the tile remains glowing. The other two tiles in this row, their symbols fade into the rock itself, becoming bare stone. What are the other symbols? Do you see any other symbols before you, Grom? Grom, directly in front of you, you see it almost looks like one of those return masks from the other day. It was like a returned face. I think I'll get on the tile with Grom then and take a look at the next row. Yeah, we'll do the same. All three of you go ahead and roll another investigation check. Nat 20. Nat 1. 22 total. Yeah, Gron, you're just looking at this this one that almost looks like a return mask. I don't know. Maybe it's just a face. You can't really tell. It's got wings. That's neat. Like a bird. But <laughs> it's like a bird. Uh, <laughs> the other two. <laughs> Isn't that cool, yeah. buddy? <laughs> <laughs> the other two, you can see, look like a crashing wave. And the third one looks like a centurion's helm wrapped in laurels. Fifteen tiles. Fifteen gods. First row, Kufix, Mogus. Ephara, this row, Phoenix, Thassa, Erois. Phoenix and Thassa are both thoughtful, but Erois is impulsive. I step on the gladiator's helm with laurels. Very cool. It glows red and white, and Andromedy, go ahead and roll me a d6. Uh, a one. Andromedy, in the distance, coming from far away but in all directions, you hear blaring regal trumpets 
for a moment. When it fades, the remaining two tiles, indeed, as you have identified, of Thassa and Phoenix, fade into bare rock floor. However, this time, the tile that had the symbol of Phoenix on it crumbles, revealing a steep black pit. Some sort of trap, perhaps. I look at Klex and say, You see the dangers that I was trying to warn you about? I mean, it may be an illusion, but how big is this hole? A ten by ten. Same as the, the space that it once occupied. I don't know what danger you're referring to. And Klex jumps over the hole. <laughs> Aiming to land... On the other side. Just on another random tile? Yeah, let's see what happens. Nice, nice, I love it. Give me an acrobatics check. Thirteen. Clicks, you jump across this pit, and you land directly on a space that looks like another face, except this one, its eyes are closed, and it has a crescent moon on its forehead. This one's got a crescent moon on its head, what does that mean? Turning back to Andromeda. As soon as you say that, it glows completely black. Go ahead and roll a d6 for me. Four. You look at Andromeda, and behind them, you see an image of a fruit tree, but instead of fruit, it has gold coins. It quickly fades as you're speaking, and you are immediately teleported back to the beginning of the room. Everyone go ahead and give me a dexterity saving throw. Can I see it? Yes. Whoops. Not 20. 19 total. Four. So these giant curling spikes drop out of the ceiling. Clicks and Gron, you are able to dodge out of the way. Andromeda, you take six piercing damage, and you would also take three poison damage, but you guys are still immune to poison. And so Clicks and Gron only take three piercing damage. The horns recede, and you remain on the tiles that you are, except Clicks is still now back at the beginning of the room. Uh, to Andromeda, Clicks says, All right, you're the expert. Which one do you need me to step on? Let me examine the tiles in front of me. The next series of tiles, as Clicks rejoins the party, you see what looks like a sun, an anvil, and the one that Clicks stepped on, which was this sort of eyes closed face with the symbol of the moon above its head. Mm. Heliod, Erebos, Perforos. Perforos was nice. True. And he is known for his impulsive nature. His whims being famous. I think that anvil will be the correct path. Clicks goes and steps on it. So, Clicks, you go first? Yep. Great. Clicks, go ahead and roll a d6 as the symbol of the anvil lights red. Three. Clicks, all of the metallic objects that you're currently wearing momentarily become extremely hot. Go ahead and make a constitution saving throw for me. Fucking cool. Six. You take five fire right, damage. Cool. Cool. Will down my temporary health pool, so that's fine. After a few seconds, the heat fades, and the rest of the party joins you as the other two symbols are magically erased from the floor. I should say, you all notice that all of the symbols that you have stepped on, all of the correct ones, are still glowing behind you. Andromedy, go ahead and give me a religion check. All right, that's your second nat one of the night. You're in timeout. <laughs> they, uh, they're all still glowing. The colors are... Pretty. Pretty uh, in this relative dim light. You turn around to see the next three in front of you, and you see the symbol of an open eye with a lightning bolt striking through it, a pair of crescent moons, as well as a pair of what look like serpent heads that are facing each other. And it's almost as if they are connected through the same body, but the body is severed in the middle. Mm. The snakes are Farica. The eye and the lightning bolts, Karanos. I believe the middle symbol may be that of Athreos. Uh, lightning makes sense. I agree. Wait, what, what, why, why does lightning make sense? I don't know. Well, that's not a very good reason. Just does. <laughs> I go and stand on the lightning. Lightning eye. Gron's just going on a hunch. Gron goes first, steps on the eye. It glows red and blue. Gron, go ahead and give me a d6. Three. 
Gran, you begin to hear the gentle falling of rain clattering on the stone and the walls all around. Give me a wisdom saving throw. Dirty 20. For the moment that this omen is transpiring, it feels really nice, very relaxing, almost comforting to Gran. I take a deep breath. Give me a religion check. Eight. The rain fades, and on the moment that it ends, you see a flash of lightning, and it's gone. That one was kind of nice. You see, Clix? Trust your instincts. All right. Final three, as the other two in this row fade and you approach, you see a symbol of four crossed arrows, a symbol of a cornucopia, and a symbol of a large dagger with what looks like string or thread being weaved through it. I point to that one. That is an icon of Clovis. There is no other way this path could end. And I go step on it. What if it's a trap? I go step on it anyway. Cool. Uh, Roll the last d6 as the symbol lights red and green. Two. You see suddenly tangled webs of silver thread on the door in front of you. Except you're not the only one that sees this. This time, all three of you see this. And they shine brilliantly, slowly enveloping the entire door until the whole door is shining this color. It fades, and with it, the door itself fades and is gone, revealing a dark hallway behind. Yeah, you guys caught on to that puzzle pretty quick. Pearl, you mean just Scala? (laughs) (laughs) Jimmy got it too. I actually still don't know what it was. I have no clue. It's a meta commentary on the Pantheon. Yeah, every tile was a god, and all the correct tiles were red-aligned gods. Okay. Red being aligned with, like, chaos and impulse. Yeah, that's great. You see a dark hallway in front of you. How do you proceed? We did it. You know, you're you're pretty smart to Andromedy. I bow my head graciously in thanks of that phrase. I will say before we proceed, the spirits in the loom chamber, warned of some dark presence beyond the puzzle room, beyond your guard. Gron leads. Uh, I've dealt with dark presences before. Let's go. Great. I will once again cast light. If Gron's leading, I'll touch Gron's maul and have that light up. Awesome. Gron's maul lights this red glow, looking very brilliant on this bronze maul. And Gron, as you lead, go ahead and give me a perception check. 14. This hallway is quite narrow, and it goes on for quite a long ways. You find yourself leading the party pretty far into this darkness, so far that you begin to lose track of the puzzle room. On a 14, you realize, like, the structure of this hallway seems oddly intact compared to the rest of the temple that you were exploring. You keep walking, and you find a set of stairs proceeding down in this hallway. You can't see the bottom of them from the top. I look back to my friends. Shall we? Let's. Clicks draws his new dagger and heads forward. All right. With my glowing maul out in front of me, I take on these stairs. Great. Gron, go ahead and roll another perception check for me. 17. On a 17, you almost don't catch this. 17 was the DC, because these are kind of hard to see. The entire set of stairs, as far as you can see, has this array of threads that crisscross various odd angles and points along the bottom, all the way down. You see that? I gesture to the threads. I will reach down and touch one of them. I I guess I'll take a closer look at it to see if there's any magic in it or anything. Are you actually going to touch it, and if so, how? I think Andromedy would just gently reach out a finger Mm -hmm. and place it upon one of the threads. You do, and it very subtly vibrates, and then you see all of the other threads vibrate in an echo. Go ahead and give me an arcana check. 15. To Andromedy on an arcana check, you look at this and you think... This is some sort of very complicated series of traps. Like, they may have been set up by magical means, but you don't really discern any kind of spellcraft to them. These threads are part of a ward on this final descent. 
I do not have the magical capability to disable it. They may be connected to traps if we step the wrong way. Well, sneaky one, you want to take the lead? Does seem like the right job for someone like me. Clix moves forward. I'll lay a hand on your shoulder. May you fulfill your destiny. Take a bit of guidance there. I'm going to do the acrobatics check. 21. Hell yeah. Jeppy, go ahead and describe how Clix would spy movie style move through this descending staircase with all of these webbed threads. But Clix is, um, you know, ducking down, sauntering around, you know, looking up and down, making sure that he's not coming in contact with anything that may trigger an alarm or a trap, you know, going down different levels of this corridor and staircase and maybe looking as cool as any of his teammates have ever seen him look so far. I think so. On a 21, hell yeah. You get to the bottom of this stairwell, which is pretty far away. You barely see Andromeda and Gron through your dark vision at the top. And in front of you, you see that the floor drops out suddenly, as if the whole chamber beyond was sunken deeper into the earth than the rest of the temple. There's about a 30-foot drop straight down to what may have been the rest of this stone staircase that lead into this space. And the floor of this enormous cave seemed to be uneven. Go ahead and give me a perception check while you're down here. 18. Thank God it was a good dice roll. You see that... Parts of this this space almost looks like they were carved or excavated out of the surrounding ruins. In the center of this large cave, you can see partially collapsed walls, as well as various pillars and columns. Within that set of walls, you see four larger columns that go up towards the ceiling of this massive cave. And finally, just on the edge of your vision, you can see what almost looks like a small ziggurat Mm -hmm. that leads up at the top of which you see a faint glowing source of light. I want to disarm the traps so the rest of the party can get to me. You turn around and you start to look at where the threads come out of the walls of this trap. There are so many within this stairwell, this corridor. I think just instinctively, clicks would think that this is going to be pretty tough. So go ahead and roll. This is going to be with your thieves' tools. So you're rolling a dexterity check with proficiency. It could also be the same as your sleight of hand if you're already proficient in sleight of hand. I'll just do sleight of hand. It's better. 22. Nice. So... Clicks, you find the one thread at the bottom of these stairs that goes almost like intersecting through another series of threads and then through the ceiling. Mm -hmm. You take your dagger, the one that you had just got, and cut at the ceiling. I like it. Where the thread goes into the ceiling of this hallway, the tension of that thread is released. It falls down through the rest of them, and you see all of them fall to the ground. The trap disarmed. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Very impressive. All right, come down here. Fuck. I think I see something. All right. So we need to climb down, you mentioned. I think Clix is going to get out his kitten pittens and start to get a rope situation going here for us to get down that 30 feet safely. It's 30 feet straight down to the floor of this cave. Gron and Andromedy, when you get to the bottom of the stairs and look at this scene, the two of you go ahead and give me perception checks. Sure thing. 16. 18. Gron, you don't notice anything past what Clix had also mentioned. On an 18, though, you get one more detail, which is you look down at the floor immediately in front of you, The vast majority of this floor is covered in bodies from this distance seemingly mummified or or petrified in whatever catastrophic events took place here ages ago. I hope you have a strong stomach. The floor down there is covered with the dead. Ooh, dead what? People. Perhaps those who came here seeking refuge when the volcano erupted. So, Clix, you go to descend the wall but go ahead and give me athletics or acrobatics take guidance to minimize risk you can also take my encouragement but we're gonna do acrobatics i'll take your encouragement i don't know if i need your guidance but i'll take it 21 
You get to the bottom easily. Again, looking very cool. Radical. Your feet touch the rubble of the stairs. So you're not touching any corpses or anything at this point, but you are surrounded by them. You immediately get a feeling of dread creep into your mind. If it weren't for the Hero's Feast, this would terrify you. How do you proceed? I'm going to play it cool with the fear. All right, come on, get down here to my party. Clix doesn't want to be alone. Clix, as you say that, I'm going to need you to go ahead and roll stealth. Ten. All right, I guess I'll head down next. I'll give myself a little bit of guidance on this. And that's going to be hopefully sufficient with an eight. Can I help them? Gron, if you want to give an assist, you could you know, hold or steady the row. Hold the pittance. Kitten pittance. Oh, never mind, a nine. Andromeda, you get maybe halfway down and then lose your grip on the rope. Go ahead and give me a dexterity saving throw. Thirteen. Okay. That will pass. You don't fall completely on your face. However, you take half of eight, which is four bludgeoning damage. Oh, was that my fault? No, no, it's all right. I'm just not accustomed to these sorts of physical activities. Oh, okay. I am. (laughs) I'm also going to have Andromeda roll stealth. This is going to be with disadvantage because you fell. Okay. A nine. The dice that I rolled was only a two. Nothing happens. Oh, God. (laughs) All right, Gron's going to grab the rope and (laughs) climb down. (laughs) Cool. Go ahead and give me athletics or acrobatics. That's a 12. Yeah, that passes. You climb down. Go ahead and roll stealth for me when you reach the rubble at the bottom. 19. What the fuck? (laughs) Gron, you descend into this chamber and you oddly stick to the wall in the shadow of the corner of this room and you think "Eh, this isn't that hard yeah that's true the three of you are basically on top of a pile of rubble and then it is just these bodies in through the rest of the chamber until you can see the the walls there are also various columns that are about 10 feet high we should head for that whatever that is pointing at the ziggurat Can I see what it is that's glowing up there? Uh, From this distance, go ahead and roll me Perception with disadvantage. It's still pretty far away. Uh, no. Five. Click starts walking towards it. He's not gonna wait. Keeping your previous stealth roll, you just go straight forward? I think I would opt to just hug the wall on the way there. I'm gonna go along the right wall until we get closer to the ziggurat. Go ahead and give me a Perception check. Two. I ain't perceiving shit. To clicks, even with dark vision, it's almost getting darker in here. You have a hard time seeing in front of you as you proceed. I follow clicks. I follow Gron. <laughs> clicks leading your party. You get to a point 40, 50 feet along this wall, and maybe 10 feet out into the chamber. The three of you see a pedestal with a small urn on the top of it. Any writing on the pedestal or the urn? Give me investigation from where you are. Dirty 20. The pedestal itself seems to have this almost grotesque carving of a more primitive rendition of Clothis. One that you'd seen previous with these three faces that are interlocking. And she appears to have a hand out with several threads that are springing forth at binding these various figures at her feet. The urn is similarly graphic, and you can tell that there is possibly something inside it. Would my knowledge of religion suggest what sort of things might be placed in such urns? Uh, Go ahead and roll a religion check. Religion or arcana? I only rolled a two. You would have to actually physically go up and, and look inside to see. That pillar depicts... Clothis' binding of the Titans, but I don't know what else could be within that vessel. Even I think we should leave it alone. As you say. Proceeding further, go ahead and roll another stealth check for me as the three of you are getting further and further along this wall. 13. 16. Also 16. Okay. You're about to the point where you can see the corner of this outer wall. It's about 20 feet high. You can see that further ahead, indeed, there's kind of a side archway 
that leads into this space on the inside of this wall. You also begin to hear faint whispering, almost like wind at first, but then you can make out various words and sentences being echoed as you move. They say, Fates, broken destinies, ruined, unmade, thread bound. Everybody go ahead and give me perception. Nat 20, plus four. Eight, plus nothing. Just a nine over here. Gron. It's almost like these whispers are coming from all of these bodies, which on a 20 leads you to believe that this place is not good news as far as (laughs) if anything were to go sideways. Oh, really? The whole ground is dead bodies. (laughs) Weird that you describe it as not good. (laughs) Not good. Uh, All right. Proceeding on, roll one more stealth check for me as you approach the archway. That's a dirty 20. Damn, Gron. Treading lightly on these dead bodies. Treading very lightly. It's only going to be a six for me. Okay. 13. As delicately as you can for someone as large and beefy as you are. And clicks leading the way is also being relatively stealthy. Andromedy in the middle, though, you are trying your best, but... Oh, no. (laughs) You step down and where your foot found previously places to avoid some of these remains. The three of you hear crack of bone beneath Andromeda's feet, which echoes throughout this cave. You immediately hear these whispers stir, and they begin to sound more like a rushing wind than actual words. From within this wind, you hear a different voice. You seek great treasure. Clicks being in front You hear that voice, but you also hear it continue in your mind. For what purpose? Because a god demands it from you? Go ahead and make a wisdom saving throw, which you do make with advantage. Seven. (laughs) Fucking stupid. This presence you feel begin to enter your mind. Okay. And then suddenly it can't. Because you are inscrutable. (laughs) But nonetheless, it says in response to this, Inscrutable thief, why take something because a god demanded it from you? Why not take it for yourself? So I think Clix for now just puts his hand on that centurion's helm, but doesn't do anything with it. Take it for yourself. Referring to whatever is in this room, not necessarily the helm that you already stole. Oh. I think Clix is going to internalize that as the helmet and just put his hand on it. That's what he thinks that the voices are referring to. Cool. What do the other two of you do? I would say passively, you both see Clix kind of... Yeah, take my hand off of the wall for a moment and put it at my side and just feel around and then go back and resume. I, knowing I've made some noise, will probably want to hurry into this central structure and urge everyone. We should try and make it to the pyramid. I agree. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I need all three of you to make dexterity saving throws for me. 13. Do I get advantage on this? Yes. 18. 15. All three of you pass as you see some of the arms of the bodies of these remains begin to twitch and move and grab out at you as you proceed inward towards these walls. You're able to evade out of the way and make it to the archway that designates these inner walls and the ziggurat beyond. And for the purposes of this group skill challenge now, I'm going to need the three of you to roll initiative. Nice. 19. 19. Uh, 7 here. It's based off dexterity, so I think I go first. Uh, Probably. 18 dex. So the three of you are at this entryway into this inner chamber. The space in here doesn't have as many bodies. Clicks, you look at the scene and you think you can find a way to leap over any that might be obstacles in your path to get to the center. But you also look up at this ziggurat, which even in this large chamber is pretty imposing. The walls of the very square cut layers being themselves about 10 feet high. Go ahead and roll an intelligence check for me. 11. For the two of your allies to do the kind of 
footwork that you know how to do as far as scaling this would probably slow you down. Knowing that, what do you do? Go for it. All right. Go ahead and give me an acrobatics check. 15. And that passes. You are able to leap over the various remains on the floor, and you make it to the wall of the ziggurat. That was about 30 feet, and so that was just your movement. Remembering also that you can cunning action for more movement, or even also act for more movement. What do you do? I just want to look around and see if there's something I can do to help make it easier for everyone to get over here. This would be investigation. Go ahead and give me an investigation check. Seven. You don't really see any way to move anything here, but you do see another one of these pedestals leaning up against this wall and kind of precariously placed. You see a small scroll. Go take it. Are you going to move any further up the ziggurat or do anything else? No, I'd rather be closer for when people... Cool. That is Gron. All right. I'm going to see if I can climb this thing. I'm going to walk up to the wall of the ziggurat near clicks. Okay. Are you going to try and avoid any of the other bodies that are here on the ground? Yeah, I'm going to do my best. Okay. So go ahead and roll acrobatics. It's a nat 20 plus two. Nice. Absolutely. You leap over them. Uh, you're now next to clicks. All right. And I am going to try to grab a hold of this ledge that's 10 feet up. Mm-hmm. I should get a running start. Uh, on a nat 20, I'll give it to you. I can do that? Okay. So then I get a running start, and I'm going to jump and try to grab this ledge. Which you can do easily because of your strength, but just go ahead and roll athletics anyways. <laughs> well, that's a three plus eight. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. You absolutely you run, you grab onto the upper ledge of this thing, and now you're on the first tier. All right. I pull myself up. You all hear, as Gron does this, this wind and noise and whispers is still in this chamber, but clicks within that you also hear. If they wanted to strike down every mortal that stood against them, they'd need not for servants to carry out their dirty work tirelessly across the ages like slaves to their wills. Clicks doesn't really know what the fuck any of that means, so... <laughs> Andromeda, it's your turn. All right. I'm going to cast Levitate on myself. Okay. And sort of use that to hover over all of these bodies. Absolutely. Uh, what level is Levitate? Second. Go ahead and roll a D100. 52. Holy fuck. Oh no, what have I done? All non-magical weapons begin crackling with the power of Nyx and become plus one magic weapons for the duration. Of the spell that I just cast? Yes. Okay, so for the next ten minutes. Amazing. Cool. Wow. Nice. Is that plus one to attack rolls and damage? It's both. Great, so Andromeda, you hover across, avoiding the obstacles. Anything else? Just get to the base of the thing. Uh, Gron, up on the first story, go ahead and make a wisdom saving throw for me, which you still make with advantage. 18. You also hear a voice in your mind... You're so much stronger than the rest of these mortals. Why not rid yourself of them? And you can tell that you are being suggested to turn on your party, but you are able to steal your mind and shrug it off. That is that, and we go back to clicks. Uh, I'm going to start making my way up. Awesome. You have second story work. You don't need to jump. You don't need to take, you know, reduced movement to climbing these walls. So you spend 10 to get up the first wall, 10 more to move across, and 10 to get up the second wall. Do you keep going? That's just one movement. I have 35. Okay. So you're halfway across the second story. And there's one floor left, right? There's another floor, and then the top also technically counts as its own floor. I'll get to the one below the top and stay there for now. Okay, so you spend your cunning action, you dash up the next wall, and you're on the second highest platform. Go ahead and give me investigation. Uh, dirty 20. You can now see the source of the faintly glowing light above you, resting on a large round pillar at the very top of this ziggurat. You see... A shorter urn, still large in its construction, with ornate, 
concave sides, the lid of which you can just barely make out, has a large, rough-cut gemstone at its center, almost like the gem itself is kind of the handle. The entire urn is faintly glowing with this sort of undulating white light. Yeah, nothing, nothing until more people are near me. There's something up here. I think you get up here. Great. Clicks, go ahead and make a intelligence check for me. 17. You know that they don't specifically call this shape an urn. They call this shape a pixis, just for the sake of nomenclature. But you look at it, and you wait for the rest of your compatriots, and go ahead and make a, another wisdom saving throw for me, still with advantage. Uh, okay, don't need to roll again. It's a nat 20. But I'll just... Oh my god, it was two net 20s in a row. No way. <laughs> Holy shit. Well, this guy super isn't connecting to you at all. But nonetheless, you hear this voice return your mind. You're close enough now that you can tell that the voice is coming from near the top of this thing. Probably not necessarily that Pixis, that urn itself, but somewhere up here. And it says... This treasure I would freely give to you, thief. All you need is to lift that Pixis from where it lay and take the treasure within it for yourself and no one else. You're not compelled or suggested to do what it says, but that's what it says. Okay. As we go to Gron. Gron's gonna back up, teetering on the edge to give him ten feet of running start and then jump up to the next level. Cool. You get, yeah, again, case of, of nat ones aside, you go ahead and roll another athletics. It's Eighteen. Easily. You leap up And you are now one level below clicks. Okay. Well, that was my action. That's all I can do. Okay. That is Andromed. Yeah, I'm just going to use the wall to sort of push my weightless body up to the top of it. Okay. That'll still count as reduced movement, but you won't have to make any checks. So that will count as 20. So then I'll take the rest of that 10 feet to get to the next wall, and then another 20 feet up, and then 10 to the next wall. So I'm a little ahead of Gron, I think, at this point. Yes, you are. We can do anything a rogue can do. <laughs> if, but a little slower. <laughs> but a little slower. That's the thing. It's like anybody can do anything a rogue can do, but you might not be as good at it, and you're definitely not going to be as fast at it. Very true. So, as all three of you can now see this light above, Clix is the only one who can see its actual source, but this wind begins to swirl up around the top of this ziggurat and diffuse that light source and a small cyclone of shadow. Everybody give me a perception check. 16. 15. 6. Andromeda, you just see this this swirling, shadowy something. But Gron and Clix, you almost see the visage of a figure within it. It's kind of large humanoid figure with almost leathery black wings, long curling horns and burning eyes, a billowing gray and black, almost like a mane flowing from its head and melding into the writhing shadows around it. Clicks especially, who rolled highest, you can also see these long pointed claws that curl and uncurl as this form stirs. The three of you all climbing this structure, you can hear it speak. Long have I slumbered in this space, and at long last, foolish treasure hunters and mortals, you will be my unbinding. Your fear may be guarded by some heroic trick. I smell your hope, and I shall feed upon it. As all three of you see the face of a demonic eater of hope, we transition into combat, and that is where we will leave things for now. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. 
We want to give a special shout out to our holy Avengers, Jake and May. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.